Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Please stand for the pledge, and if you choose, remain standing for the invocation. Thank you. Pastor Jake Rogers from Generation. Hi. God, Lord, we just pray that you would just bless this meeting, that you would give wisdom and guidance as these leaders, God, lead our town, that they would have the wisdom and guidance needed to put us in the, in the direction that we need to continue to go, God, and that you would just use this town in a great way. We thank you. Bless this time. Amen. Thank you. Roll call, please. Mayor Dickey. Here. Vice Mayor Calaviannakis. Here. Councilmember Fidel. Present. Councilmember McMahon. Here. Councilmember Grzybowski. Present. Councilmember Toth. Present. Councilmember Skillicorn. Here. Anyone wishing to address the council regarding items listed on the agenda or under call to the public should fill out a request to comment card located in the back of the council chambers and hand it to the town clerk prior to consideration of that item. When your name is called, please approach the podium, speak into the microphone, and state your name for the public record. Please limit your comments to three minutes. It is the policy of the mayor and the town council to not comment on items brought forth under call to the public. However, staff can be directed to report back to the council at a future date or to schedule items raised for a future council agenda. Thank you, Linda. We start with our reports by our town manager and council members. Rachel? Great. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Good evening, everybody. I just had two really quick updates. Um, one is to recognize and thank um, our staff and all of our volunteers that were part of our volunteer reception last week. Um, I know a number of our council were there. Um, it was a great event. We had a couple hundred folks there um, where all of our town um, volunteers are honored. And then a number of volunteers are recognized um, as our standouts for the year. Um, thank you to Kim and Nita and Renee and our staff that put the event on. But most of all, thank you to all of our volunteers that support us day in and day out. Um, secondly, I did want to mention that this weekend, this Saturday, is our music fest at, down at Fountain Park. Um, lots of great music, bands, um, food, all kinds of stuff. So it is a fantastic weekend. We hope to see you down there on Saturday. Thank you, Mayor. I had the pleasure of attending the Dark Sky Festival on Saturday. It was a lovely event. I see a lot of you in the crowd, so great job. And I mean, amazing as always. I'm so excited for, for the Dark Sky Discovery Center project. I actually got the chance to meet someone who's trying to uh, get Cave Creek to become a Dark Sky community, which is so fantastic to hear. You're all setting an example for communities around Arizona, and I'm really grateful for you. And looking forward to seeing everybody at Music Fest. Uh, that's all I have, though. I attended the quarterly GPEC board meeting, and we had a lot going on the past couple of weeks, so I'm just gonna mention the two really good, feel-good events that we held last week. We had the annual Hall of Fame dinner where nine very worthy candidates uh, were inducted into the Hall of Fame, a couple of which are actually here today. And then the following night, we had the annual volunteer reception, which the town manager just spoke about. It, I love the way we do it now. It's, it seems very fancy and formal. It used to be so casual, but now it, it really, it's a real good feel good event and I appreciate you guys doing that for us. Um, the volunteer reception is for people that help out at the community events, people like the crisis team, the give a lift folks. We have a lot of volunteer opportunities that the town does in general where the Hall of Fame is a little bit more than just being a town volunteer. So that's why it's important to hold both of these things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. I too attended the uh, Fountain Hills Days Festival that we had here that was very well done, by the way. Um, and the Dark Skies Festival was really fantastic. The number of telescopes and the things that I saw there were really, really pretty cool. So that's the nerdy side of me, I guess. But anyway, uh, it was really well, well attended and uh, great food trucks too. 
And then we, uh, as they mentioned, the volunteer reception, that's really important because with a town of volunteers, it's really great to give them some recognition and some credit. So very well done, Rachel, on that. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I attended a Valley Metro board meeting and just want to let everybody know that the conversion to electric buses is moving forward pretty quickly, which will be nice. Also, um, I attended the community chorus event at the community center. It was really, really lovely. And also the Hall of Fame dinner, honoring um, Allen Magazine, a prior council member, Mr. Brown, a prior council member. I don't know if Cindy Couture's here. She's a retired high school teacher. And also Tammy Bell, who works at the chamber and is the chair of our Fountain Hills uh, Protect Our Youth Coalition. It was really a nice event and great to honor these people. They give so much to our community. Also, the town's volunteer reception, that was really well done. Kim did a great job. And it was really nice to see all the volunteers get recognized. And in fact, I believe our ratio of volunteers in town to our population is the highest in the valley. I mean, you, I don't think any other town has as many dedicated proactive volunteers as we do. So thank you for all your service, you guys. We appreciate it. And I volunteered at the Dark Sky Festival. And as everybody said, it was really, really a wonderful event. The kids loved it. They got to participate in little stations, etc. I think, um, I don't know, Debbie Miller knows, but I think there were a couple thousand people there. I mean, we had a lot of people there. It was really, really great and well done. And, the, and also, we're going to have another, um, also, we had a CARES forum. And the CARES Forum um, was put on by the committee and thank my fellow council members and Bo Larson for putting it on. We had a great discussion about civility from a professor and a newspaper editor. And it was really, really nice. And contrary to some of the disrespectful remarks that were made about the town putting on this event, it was the largest attended forum thus far. And that says something. Also, um, the Dementia Friendly Town Committee is putting on a um, taking care of yourself, care for the dementia caregiver. It's going to be at the community center on April 8th. It's free. We're going to have a lot of information, some great speakers. I put flyers on the back table, and I hope you guys will attend. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, hi, everybody, and uh, thanks for coming tonight. Um, for all of you people on live stream and YouTube and here in person, thank you. As I always say, an active and engaged public leads to good governance, and in Mountain Hills, we are blessed with that. Um, I just came back from a week-long trip to the East Coast. Um, I was uh, had a host of Atlanta. Thank you very much for putting up with me, offering my lodging, and giving me your rental car, or a car where she get a rental. So I appreciate that. I'm back. I'm nourished, and I'm refreshed and ready to go. Um, as you can see... Thanks, everybody, for the thoughts and the prayers. On my, I don't have eyegla or sunglasses on tonight. <laughs> I'm back to regular. Um, it's kind of a scary thing, and it was very inconvenient for being on the council. But um, a couple months ago, when the doctor said, you know, you have cataracts and your vision is diminishing, it's getting worse and worse, uh, he said, all we have to do is this procedure. It's very, it's easy to do, and you'll be whole again. And so I did it, and you guys put up with it. But um, I got good vision again, and I'm whole, so I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate everybody reaching out to me and, and uh, caring for me. Um, I also did um, go with the mayor and uh, Peggy to the, uh, the Fountain Hills Cares meeting. Um, again, I do believe in civility, and I think it's a good message for this town. Civility forges acceptance and connection that we all want and we all need. Incivility makes us feel small and discarded. It appeals to our crude and our baser instincts. F civility raises us up and inoculates our hearts with kindness, and it also has been proven to be an important part of staying healthy. And we are a health and wellness community, and if we treat each other with respect and dignity, it will all feel better. Um, the one thing that I, I did go to, I don't think anybody mentioned, was the capital improvement retreat that I did up here on, uh, on, on the, the town bridge. <clears throat> Again, just very important because a lot of times people say we didn't know things were coming and then all of a sudden they appear to council and you guys are voting on stuff. Well, this stuff generally takes a year or two and there's, there's retreats and all sorts of things. Um, we have another one coming up, I believe, um, within the month 
And so it's, it's very important if you're concerned about this business, don't just come to council meetings and, and say we didn't know. Because you, you, this, this past week, we, uh, we had a number of community services and public works projects. We talked about town park projects. One was targeted at stargazing and in a dark sky community that, was, that should be really popular. Sidewalk infill, roadway expansion, drainage and flood mitigation, more public restrooms, pickleball, and community center improvements were just some of the things we discussed. So again, if you want to know what's going on in Fountain Hills, you got to come to these retreats. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. That's all I have for tonight. No report tonight, Madam Mayor. Thanks a lot. There, as you can see, a lot's been going on. So had MAG Regional Council. Um, I'm going to refer you to their website, which is azmag.gov, because there were, was, were some good presentations. One was Fountain Hills being recognized for joining the region in efforts uh, to reduce homelessness, and it's always in ways that are appropriate to each community. So I appreciated that we were part of that uh, presentation, uh, giving uh, solutions that, like I say, they're appropriate to the city. So it's like a, a town of Paradise Valley and Fountain Hills, we have our own way of helping out. Uh, MAG leaders met with an appeal to EPA regarding reevaluating re our air quality status. I don't know if you've been paying attention to that at all, but we're kind of in a on the verge of uh, getting down a notch, uh, which is going to affect uh, certain big projects that are coming to Arizona. So it was good to see that they were there trying to discuss the desert and the storms and, and the fires and other things that might affect our air quality. Um, the modeling and studies that MAG does are crucial to planning for the, our future transportation needs, as we know, including in primarily uh, roads and streets. And this has led to uh, good rankings that you'll see if you look at the presentation that we have as a metropolitan area for travel times and for costs and for being the fifth largest city in the country. Um, it was quite impressive. I had my quarterly meeting with the Fountain Hill superintendent, the district superintendent, we did Fountain Hills Cares, um, something really unusual. East Valley mayors and the U.S. Conference of Mayors were invited by the city of Mesa and Major League Baseball to celebrate the Play Ball Initiative. I was just talking to Rachel about that. It's a really neat thing for our youth. And um, so I got to be on the field and wave on behalf of uh, Fountain Hills at a Cubs-Giants game with all the other mayors. So that was uh, very nice and appreciated. Fountain Hills Day, which was... Um, really awesome. Thank you to the chamber for that, um, giving everybody the opportunity to enjoy that gorgeous weather. Uh, the capital improvement work study last Tuesday, and then we're going to have the budget work study next Tuesday. So that's going to be four Tuesdays in a row. So we got to <laughs> put a stop to this now. Uh, <laughs> the Hall of Fame dinner. Congratulations to everybody who got that. That was a wonderful volunteer reception. Again, thanks to staff and, of course, all of our volunteers and the Dark Sky Festival with the lobster rolls, which uh, I'm always gonna go for, even if they, uh, let's see, $31, they were awesome. <laughs> so, um, so, and some news apropos, a recent topic here that I think uh, Councilman Skillcorn had brought up about, uh, and it goes with our proclamation of International Dark Sky Week. So in, in anticipation of the groundbreaking that's gonna happen on Monday, which is during the eclipse, the uh, International Dark Sky Discovery Center uh, is including a place called the Pluto Snack Station, right? I saw it on the map. So I want to make note that Pluto is now the official state planet of Arizona. <laughs> so while many believe that it is a dwarf planet, and I know somebody was um, kind of challenging this, actually some in the community still look at it as a planet. And the reason it's important to Arizona, it was first discovered at Lowell Academy or Observatory in Flagstaff in 1930. So that will lead me right into the proclamations, which I have two uh, things to do here. We're going to present the Fountain Hills Dark Sky Associations, I think Vicki and Joe and whoever else wants to come up with uh, board members for uh, Dark Sky, International Dark Sky Week. And then we'll immediately go into presenting the Citizens Streets Advisory Committee they received special recognition at the uh, volunteer dinner and uh, at the reception. And this is for all of their work, many, many months of work distilling the data that we did get from the IMS report, which is 
get you cross-eyed if you look at that a little too long, and these guys put it in English for us. So we're coming up with a comprehensive plan that they will have options that the council will be able to consider, but their, uh, their labors are done for now. So I'm gonna come down and we'll do, uh, first we're gonna do the dark sky. So if you all wanna meet me down there, I'll present it. Come on up. Come on, come on, come on. All right, I'll start reading it, and then you all, whoever would like to say a few words, any or all of you, you're welcome to. So, whereas the aesthetic beauty and wonder of a natural dark sky is a shared heritage of all humankind, and whereas the experience of standing beneath a starry sky inspires feelings of wonder and awe and encourages a growing interest in science and nature, especially among young people and visitors, and whereas light pollution has scientifically established economic and environmental consequences which result in significant impacts on the ecology and human health of all communities. And whereas Arizona hosts 10% of the world's largest telescopes, including the world's largest, largest optical telescope, and many of the most revered observatories, including Lowell, Smithsonian, U of A, Kitt Peak, and the Vatican Observatories, and in the future, the International Dark Sky Discovery Center, what? <laughs> and whereas the optical astronomy, which is endangered by unfettered light pollution, represents a statewide capital investment of more than $1.3 billion, geez, and an annual economic return of over $250 million, including an indirect attachment to more than 150,000 jobs through the aerospace and de defense sector. And whereas the Fountain Hills Dark Sky Association provides free education, resources, and solutions to the public to encourage the protection of and enjoyment of dark skies and responsible outdoor lighting. So therefore now I, Mayor Ginny Dickey, on behalf of the Town of Fountain Hills, proclaim the week of April 2nd through April 8th, 2024, as International Dark Sky Week, and ask each resident to join me in observing this important week and raising awareness and support for protecting our precious dark sky resources. That's a mouth. Well, thank you. Um, we appreciate that. And of course, we're so excited about what's going on. We just had a great festival, as you know. Uh, we have another major event coming up next Monday, the groundbreaking. We already have um, confirmed attendees from the governor's office, from Senator Kelly's office, Senator Sinema's office, uh, Chris Camacho, greater, you know, C, uh, CEO of the Greater Phoenix Economic Council. The list goes on, and it's going to be a big event. We've been getting publicity throughout the Phoenix area. I just hope half of Phoenix doesn't show up, <laughs> but it's going to be a great time. Yeah, and I wanted to really just thank all of the current council mayor and past council members and mayor that um, you guys have been so supportive of our efforts here in Fountain Hills since day one. And we are super appreciative of that and our community thanks you. Thank you, thank you so much. So Justin's going to take this, and I will hand out the plaques. Madam Mayor and Council Members, I thank you for the opportunity. This is the second time in recent days I've had the honor of recognizing this group of volunteers. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Fountain Hills Advisory Streets Committee stands out as a beacon of the community involvement and dedication to the betterment of our town's infrastructure. They were formed in 2021. The Citizens Advisory Streets Committee comprised engaged residents offering an impressive collection of experience 
They offered invaluable input and guidance on how the town could effectively manage its streets and pavement repairs for the next two decades and beyond. Their collaborative efforts resulted in innovative solutions to stretch the town's resources while maintaining the integrity and, excuse me, integrity and safety of the roadways. The tireless work of the Citizen Advisory Streets Committee exemplifies the power of community engagement and volunteerism in effecting positive change. Their proactive approach to addressing the challenges of the street maintenance and repair serve as an inspiration. I'm going to call out all of their names. Not all of them are in attendance. Gentlemen, when I call your name, if you would please come up here. Jerry Butler. <laughs> Kim Cancelo. <laughs> Jim Dickey. Mark Graham, Buck Haworth, Bernie Honley, Dean Houston, Jeffrey Allen Kerr, Carl Mant, Joe Mueller, Christopher Plum, Gary Salovich, Greg Dudash, and George Mitchell. Anybody want to come on? Who wants to take it? He's not. Who's one who wants to be the one to say hello? Hello. <laughs> As uh, our public works director commented at the beginning of this, yes, the committee put in a lot of hours. And I think we have come up with a program unlike many times before, at least three times before, where this has been addressed, we tried to take a different approach this time because the ones that have been tried twice before haven't worked. So hopefully this one will take the community forward and we'll have better streets in the near future. Thank you. Third time's a charm. Thank you guys. I think, did you get a picture yet? Okay, we'll do one real quick. Thank you all very much. We have some presentations tonight. Our first one is from Cox Communication, and Jamie Boyette is here. I don't know if Rachel had anything to say or if you'd like to come Actually, on Actually, I think Bo's going to do our introduction for us tonight. Thank you. I'm everywhere today. It didn't work. Give me one second, please, and I'll uh, full screen. There we go. Um, Mayor and council members, um, I'm really honored to introduce uh, Jamie Boyette, who's the manager of government affairs for Cox Communications. As you know, we'd like to bring in some of our uh, partners that we have to get, kind of give a yearly update of what's going on, uh, not only in their own um, industry, their company, but what they're doing to impact and make lives better here in the town of Fountain Hills. So I'd like to introduce uh, Jamie Boyette um, to give the presentation for Cox Communications. Thank you. 
All right. Hi. Mayor, members of the council, my name is Jamie Boyette. I'm the manager of government affairs for Cox Communications in the Phoenix metro area. I appreciate you guys allowing me to be here tonight to give you a little overview of uh, Cox and what we're up to. Um, so just to give you guys a little bit of history, um, Cox Communications is part of Cox Enterprises. Cox Enterprises was founded back in 1898 by James M. Cox and originally was a newspaper. Obviously, we have grown tremendously since then. We are now over 125 years old and we are a privately held communications, media, and automotive services company with more than 23 billion in revenue and over 50,000 employees throughout the United States. Um, some of the subsidiaries of Cox Enterprises, I think Cox Communications is the one that most everybody knows, that is our residential arm. So that, with, on the residential side, we provide uh, video, voice, and data products to residents within the town of Fountain Hills. We also have a Cox business arm that provides um, business services to small, medium, and large companies. Again, if they provide data, phone, video, cloud services, and many other things that uh, your, your businesses may need uh, to, to operate on a daily basis. We also have Cox Media. Cox Media is our advertising arm. So they are able to assist, again, small, medium, and large businesses, uh, government entities, and individuals with any advertising needs they may need. Uh, they can go speak to our Cox advertising, our Cox Media folks. They can help them come up with the plan and help them execute that. Uh, we also have Cox Automotive. Um, under Cox Automotive, we have uh, consumer-facing businesses like autotrader.com, Kelly Blue Book, and Mannheim Auctions. Another thing that we just acquired is Cox Farms. So Cox is also looking to get into sustainable farming as well. So that is greenhouses where you can pr uh, pr uh, grow produce and stuff like that. So here in Arizona, Cox generates 5.5 billion in total economic activity in Arizona each year. We also contribute to vital state and local government programs in Arizona, generating over 84 million in property taxes, sales and gross receipts and other fees annually. We support over 14,000 uh, jobs here within the state of Arizona, and we have enough fiber and coaxial infrastructure in the state to wrap around the entire globe. From a social impact, Cox is proud to be a longstanding and integral part of nearly 40 communities in Arizona, four counties, three military bases, and two of the state's uh, colleges, state, state universities here. We have demonstrated an annual community investment to Arizona uh, by providing cash, grants, and in-kind contributions of nearly 33 million. Uh, some of those are UMOM New Day Centers, Habitat for Humanity, uh, Boys and Girls Clubs of the Valley, Chicanos por la Casa, and many, many other organizations that our employees help. We have a Cox Charities Foundation, which our employees uh, contribute to on a, on a yearly basis. Um, those employees also determine who those, those uh, funds go to, uh, to nonprofit organizations as well. In, in Fountain Hills, residents have um, the opportunity to get internet, video, and voice services um, through Cox Communications. As I mentioned, we're a broadband communications and entertainment company that provides those advanced services um, over our own nationwide IP network. We're committed to creating meaningful moments of human connection through bo uh, broadband applications and services. Cox is also dedicated to ensuring digital equity for all households in our communities. The digital divide prevents people from gaining access to the internet, information, and resources they need to prosper, which is why we'll continue our 10 plus year commitment to providing low cost services to low income families in our communities. Right now we do have two digital equity programs that are available to residents today. One is Connect to Compete. We have had that available for um, 10 plus years to the community that is for residents who have children in the K through 12 school, school system. If they are on the free or reduced, reduced lunch program, they qualify for that program. It provides them 100 megabits of download. Um, free Wi-Fi modem, there is no uh, contract uh, associated with this as well. When COVID hit, we realized that we also needed to assist 
the rest of the population that needed assistance as well. So we created the Connect Assist program. It's the exact same program. It assists um, uh, residents who are on SNAP, uh, SSI, those types of programs. And again, it's 100 megs, uh, no uh, free uh, modem, no, no contract. And that is $30 a month for residents that to qualify for that program. As men, uh, um, wanted to mention that uh, Cox, we do invest in our network uh, continuously. Um, we have invested 2.7 billion in Arizona over the last 10 years. That is not going to stop. We will continue to invest in our network to make sure that we are providing a reliable service as well as meeting customers' needs and demands. Uh, Arizona, or Cox was voted number one fastest ISP in Arizona per UCLA in quarter four of 2023. And we have done speed increases without price changes. Our system also allows us to do 24-7 network monitoring, so hopefully we are able to capture when residents are um, having issues with their services prior to them noticing. Obviously, that is not always the case. There are circumstances such as if something gets cut, we have other issues where we need to replace equipment, that sort of thing, where it may uh, take us a little bit longer to um, to get those fixed. And we also do have a redundant network operations center, which again ensures ongoing monitoring. Today in Fountain Hills, um, all residents are able to get up to one gig of speed uh, for data. We do have up to two gig. That is currently not available to all residents in Arizona. It's about 67% that has that um, option, but we are working to um, get two gig to all of our residents. Um, in Arizona, but as you can see, we have a number of options available depending upon the needs of our residents for data service. And to sum it up, um, all, as I mentioned, all Cox residential, uh, Cox residential residents in Fountain Hills have the access to receive up to one gig of internet. Uh, we um, want to seek to um, be the, a great internet provider and to provide a variety of internet speeds to the residents here. We will continue to work to, um, to make our network scalable and we're working to um, continue to provide even more gigs of service up to 10 gigs in the near future. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. We really appreciate that information. Um, any questions? Comments from council, uh, Vice Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, yeah, it's it's good to know that you have those programs designed for the um, the SNAP and, and the people that are on limited incomes. And also, I think it's very generous for you to offer that program for people with K to twelve children to give them affordable internet. I think that um, that's a, a key to the future. I think of this whole country is to provide internet services and connectivity with the youth, and, and that's a way to really help. So I really appreciate what you guys are doing there. And if you ever come up with a program for underpaid town council people, <laughs> please send me an email. <laughs> Thank you. I know this wasn't the focus of the presentation, but I'm really interested in the Cox farming thing. Do you, uh, do you know where I could go to learn more about that program? I'm very curious. Yes, I will send you information about that. You're welcome. Well, thank you. I know that um, you remind me of um, you know, old school corporate partners who give back to the communities and uh, you came through so much in the pandemic. But my really important question that now I don't have to answer anymore is, were the di are you gonna cover the Diamondbacks games? And yes, you came are. through on <laughs> opening day, so uh, real happy about that. 34. <laughs> Channel 34, yep. So, um, so rather than, uh, than ask that more vital sports questions, I will <laughs> make sure anybody else has any questions, no? Thank you. We appreciate you coming out, and uh, we also know that you're available if we ever need you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have another presentation, and this is going to be by our chief about our first quarter update on the fire department. So uh, is there any introduction to that? I don't think any introduction is needed other than uh, come on down, Chief Ott. <laughs> no, that is not. <laughs> I'm your PIO. Give a slide. Does that make you understand? 
Yeah, he didn't make anything. And every good chief will tell you they need a good PIO, and, and Bo's doing an outstanding job. So uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and Council. Um, I am pleased to be here. We are 90 days old, so in a couple days. But uh, um, I could make it like the Academy Awards and stand up here and thank everybody that, that's helped us get to this point, but that would take all night. And Larry's told me that I only have five minutes. So um, I'll try to hit the highlights. Uh, but we did have a, a lot of people involved all the, all the way around the valley, uh, including everybody on the dais, uh, previous members that had been on the dais, and uh, the supporting chiefs from all the neighboring fire departments have all been uh, a, a huge part in us getting to where we're at today at this point. And 90 days might seem like a long time. To me, it seems like it's been nine years um, and maybe longer if we talk about how long it's been in the kind of in the uh, works. and. Uh, Scott LaGreca did a huge job in getting us uh, to where we are today. So uh, we've gone, we went live January 1st, 2024, but we actually started our transition uh, through the Mesa Regional Dispatch Center on December 12th. And since that date, we've had 1,534 uh, total number of, of event calls in Fountain Hills. And comparative to last year for the same amount of time, we had 1,260. So we're up, fireman math, about 300 uh, calls from what we had the previous year. Uh, I don't know that that's really more of a, uh, it's just a trend in how things are going, um, not necessarily reflective of the dispatch system itself. We do have a little bit better accountability of what the calls are uh, through the new dispatch than we'd had previously. So uh, that's helped us out a little bit. Uh, the total number of calls that we were dispatched on, which also includes calls into Scottsdale, uh, calls to Rio Verde, calls to Fort McDowell, and some calls down on the, uh, up and down the B-line, uh, was, was a little bit higher. We went up to uh, uh, 1,571. Uh, we've had about 700 calls where we've had assistance, which we didn't necessarily have in the past. And some of that assistance is coming from AMR with a, uh, an ambulance response that's not uh, AMBO 341 that's stationed up here all the time. It would be another AMR ambulance that's either moving up or coming because we need additional ambulances. That's included in that 700 uh, assistance calls there. It also includes the number of calls that we've gotten from Phoenix Fire where Scottsdale Fire has assisted us on calls. It includes Rio Verde when Rio Verde comes into town when we've called them for assistance and both Salt River and Fort McDowell. So our partners uh, on the Indian community side of things have been huge on getting us to this point as well. Uh, very supportive and as always, we can't really do what we do in Fountain Hills without the support of uh, the Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation. So uh, of that, I kind of went through and thought, you know, what were our, our uh, biggest surprises? And I think that, that it kind of goes to the amount of effort that was put into planning in the small details that I was really kind of stumped on what, what big surprises were. I didn't wake up any day through the transition and go, oh, we forgot this, this is a critical point, we forgot that. There's been some minor things and we've made adjustments, but we'll continue to do that through the rest of the life of, of this fire department. So uh, no real big surprises. Um, we did do some additional things uh, to help out. We added an additional uh, scheduling software to kind of interface with the paycheck system that the town uses for all its employees. Uh, we are a little bit unique, uh, not just in uh, being firefighters, but our schedules and how that time works back and what that looks like to a payroll system. And I have to give big thanks to Dave Trimble and, and Jeanette and um, Tiffany in being able to help us get payroll processed uh, every two weeks. But we went out and uh, found this uh, scheduling program that's really geared more towards the fire service. Uh, Dave and his staff thought that it would be a big benefit, so we went ahead and bought that. That was something that we hadn't really planned on, but it was a $4,000 uh, addition that we thought was, was well worth it, and I think Dave will, will agree that it it's, saves a lot of time and it's just down to some manual input opposed to trying to mesh two systems that would never, never talk to each other. Um, kind of one of our... Uh, other accomplishments that we've made so far is we have 
probably pretty close to 90% of the intergovernmental agreements in place that we'll need to kind of move forward. And those are mutual aid agreements with uh, Fort McDowell, Rio Verde, Salt River, uh, Scottsdale. We finally just uh, signed off on that uh, two weeks ago. I appreciate that. That was a, a big uh, check mark off of my board as well. Uh, we also have training IGAs with the city of Glendale uh, for their grip stick facility, and we're in the process of uh, finalizing the IGA for training with Mesa. We have IGAs for major reason, Mesa Regional Dispatch Center for our dispatch. We have an IGA with the uh, TRWC, which is Topaz Regional, Regional Wireless Cooperative that is also a component of our dispatch center. Um, we have uh, a couple other IGAs that are slipping my mind, but I know I've got a stack of them on my desk and, and I've only got a couple more to bring to you, so I appreciate your patience as we move forward with that. Uh, I think our biggest challenges that I look at moving forward um, will probably be along the lines of recruitment, but that's gonna be years down the road. Uh, the fire service as a whole is having a challenge with recruitment. Uh, I, I don't see us being any different, although this is the best place definitely in the Valley to work and probably the state. So uh, we'll go off of that. And I think that a lot of people have called initially just to find out whether we're hiring, when we're gonna hire. So from my standpoint, that's a good sign that I've had people all, all across the country and all across the Valley wanna know how they can get in and be a part of Fountain Hills Fire Department. Um, I think one of the other things moving forward will just be making sure that we can adjust to everything that, that happens. And there's fire departments around the valley that are um, decreasing the call types that they go on. And that's purely because they can't keep up with the volume of calls that they have. And they felt it's necessary to, to eliminate some of those call types. And I hope that we never get to that point because that's a lack in service and we're all about the service. I, I joke about us being a full service department uh, we, we'll do just about everything and anything that uh, will benefit the residents of the, the town. So uh, we look forward to another fantastic 90 days and just keep multiplying as we go. I'll be happy to answer any questions if you do. Chief, thanks very much for the orderly smooth transition. And I think it's been pretty seamless to the residents in the town and, and to us up here too. So. You're very detailed and organized. We appreciate that. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for the chief? Thank you. No? Well, I think everybody's very grateful for the way this has worked out and um, glad that we could get the uh, agreement with Scottsdale done and um, anything else that comes up, we're happy to look at and, um, and get us on the way. Um, do you need anything from us? Uh, Madam Mayor, Council, I do not, just your continued support. And I would be remiss if I did not uh, um, commend my staff. They're just super. So I can't think of a better group of people to work with. So, well, thank thank you. you so much. Thanks, sir. Our next item is call to the public, which are for items that are not on the agenda. Please state your name and the city or town that you are from. That's okay, Mayor. We do have um, four comment cards for call to the public. We will start off with Eric Wyckoff, and then on deck is Liz Gildersleeve. Right here. I'm going to read this to you. In my wife's beautiful glasses, uh, quite stylish, because I forgot mine. So, I'm sure I look fabulous. This is gonna be polarizing. It's, I think it's rare you get a person like me that actually comes in here and speaks to you. My name's Eric Wyckoff, speaking here today. I now fear for my own career. All I say applies thrice fold to fire departments, ironically enough. I've been a law enforcement officer for over 30 years, the vast majority in a supervisory capacity. I've resided in town nearly that long. I have never spoken or attended this forum before until called to do so now. Recently, I was unlawfully detained. Never thought this would happen in my life by an MCSO deputy pursuant to a traffic stop. 
During this time, he issued me a written warning after telling me other town citizens receive very expensive citations for the same thing. Remember that. Upon consultation and garnering unanimous concurring support from many north of 20 colleagues, I complained that my Fourth Amendment rights were violated by the Maricopa County Sheriff's Department. I was concerned about a false public record issued in my name with no due process to defend myself because it was a written warning. MCSL's professional standards failed to properly investigate the matter by never contacting me, suppressing relevant video evidence of the events, and while drafting a copy to the offending deputy and his union, while never drafting a copy to the citizen at this time, me. Consider that. Remember it. Why? Police aren't heroes. Police are not villains. Police are bureaucrats. They're employees. They exist to protect the bureaucracy with protection of people, a mere afterthought. I've been doing this 30 years. I've been a supervisor, 22 of it. Okay? Saying such, I now fear for my own career. Due to union strength, there is little accountability for police. In my case, the MCSO system clearly worked to cover for their deputy. This is what bureaucracies do. About 40% of your budget is public safety. Work to minimize this. From my experience, you cut your expenditures 25% and notice no difference. They're largely playing video games behind businesses or churches. Fountain Hills is a distant suburb separated by mountains from the valley. The hilly terrain and wealth of the area largely insulates us from crime. Deputies call it Fountainberry here. Think Mayberry. Reduce this overhead and put it into crime prevention through environmental design. Accepted. Uh, if you wish to reduce crime, make this place as nice as possible with the money that you save. It's the perfect town to add impressive guard gates, possibly arches to points of entrance and exit along Shane north of town. I'm not saying block them. I'm just saying make it nice, so nice that criminals go, whoa, I'm not there. I've been doing it 30 years. It makes the biggest difference of anything I've seen. If you choose not, I'm almost done, at least take an active role in supervising MCSO. View their GPS. They'll fight you. See them sitting still for hours or perhaps doing meaningless things. Be active. Uh, thank Conduct you, sir. impromptu time motion studies of their activities. You may be astonished it has been allowed sir, to develop this far. Your time is up. I'm due sorry. To strong unions. Your time's up. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank I'm you. I'm almost done. I have no, no, seconds. everybody gets three minutes. I'm sorry, sir. Okay. We just have to be fair. Thank you. Okay. I'll send you all an email with the, re the uh, remaining one. Okay. It had that much left. Thank you. Good evening all, Liz Gildersleeve, Fountain Hills resident. I wanted to talk tonight about the ethics complaint that I filed last week against Council Member Calavianakis with our town manager. As a result of a recent public records request for communications between Calavianakis and Sandor regarding a parking agreement, I received an email conversation between Calavianakis and Justin Eller, which stated that he wants Calavianakis's quote, personal email address to send documents. We don't want these in the public domain, end quote. Also included is Calavianakis's prompt response to him, confirming her personal email address, demonstrating a clear intent and willingness to receive information. This email conversation should be disturbing to everyone, including those of you on the dais. Hiding information from the public is never okay. There are better ways Calavianakis could have responded to Eller. Readily sharing a private email address is not one of them and confirms a cozy relationship with the developer, just as many of us, excuse me, many of us had indicated during several call to publics at the January 17th town council meeting before the Sandor vote, where coincidentally, Calavianakis voted in favor of the Sandor high density apartment project. Worth noting is that the two easement agreements between the Sandor representative and Target that were received as part of the same public records request 
were fully executed a day after the December 2023 meeting where the Planning and Zoning Commission voted against the Sandor proposal and one month prior to the town council meeting. It's as if Sandor already knew that they had had enough votes on the council to push their project forward. Given the inappropriate email exchange between Sandor and Kalavianakis that I just read to you, one could assume they did. During the January 17th town council meeting, Kalavianakis vehemently denied any impropriety with Sandor. Her email exchange with Sandor, which opens up many questions, suggests otherwise. For a council member to so willingly share a private email with the express purpose of hiding information from public view is clearly an ethics violation. What other communications and documents were sent to Kalavianakis' private email account? Can any explanation from Kalavianakis be believed or trusted at this point? Thank you for your time and attention tonight. Next, we have Chris Enos and on deck, Ed Stizza. Sorry, I guess I should have stuck through up here. All right. I actually have two things, but I'm not going to have time for one. The other is an agenda item, so if it's all right, I'll come back to address that one. Yes. Because Did I'm you say what now. city you're from, please? I'm sorry. What town? I'm Chris Enos, and I live here in Fountain Thank Hills, you. and I'm here to talk about what I see now is ethics wars. It's sort of like high school. And with all due respect, I said it once, I don't like repeating myself. Don't make me come back again. This is what you gotta do. You gotta re reform your, division, your provisions of your town code that deal with ethics. Right now, they're not very clear. I said that before. Secondly, every council member up here has rights and duties. You have a right and a duty to investigate before making a vote. So you can have a conversation with Satan himself if you want to, if it's gonna help you make a vote on something and it's perfectly legitimate. There's nothing wrong with that. Secondly, you have a right to ask questions. There are questions asked, there was questions asked before as I brought out before, that's not an ethics violation. So with all due respect, um, let's not revisit what we did in high school. Let's now put on your big boy pants, have your friends hold their water, toughen up. This is an agenda that you have to deal with. These are real issues that you have to deal with, and we don't have time for a little name calling between council members. And I appreciate you doing your job up here. I really do. What is it, $400 a month? <laughs> it ain't worth it. What I gotta say is, I appreciate you doing your job. I hope you aren't dissuaded from continuing to try to do your job and your due diligence and asking your questions simply because some people might complain about it in public and behind your back or otherwise. So thank you for being council people. Continue to do your jobs and let's everybody put on their big boy pants. That's it for public comment. I'm sorry, Ed. I'm sorry, Ed. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, and sorry, staff, and Aaron. Uh, hope everybody had a great Easter. So, um, no, no, I, I should, okay, so I was going to bring popcorn in case anybody wanted some while I was speaking. So anyway, um, there's so much happening within our town right now that is absolutely embarrassing. And uh, I, too, attended the civility meeting, and I sure hope all of you learned something from it also, the ones that attended. 
Um, I think it has been, I'm kind of in shock actually that we don't have a public barrage of Alan Skillicorn tonight, thank God. You know, so I think it has gotten completely out, completely out of hand and uh, obviously somebody has talked to the people that are sitting right behind me that are, have not gotten up here today uh, and spoke at Call to the Public. I, I'm absolutely grateful for that because everything that's been said about Alan and the processes that were done were absolutely uncalled for and uh, it's sad, it's sad. So hopefully everybody learned something from this. I really, really hope so. I learned a few things from the civility meeting, okay? Didn't agree with everything, um, but one of the things I really didn't understand at the last meeting is why Mayor Dickey stopped me from speaking on behalf of Alan Skillicorn. So you did, and I, we have all turned our cards in uh, to speak at, uh, at the last minute, and the last gentleman to speak also spoke uh, or turned in his card right before I did at the last minute. And that allowed me, unfortunately I made it late to the meeting and I missed call to the public, but uh, I was standing in this room and handed over my speaker card uh, during that agenda item. Um, so, I was told I wasn't allowed to speak, and I had more than enough time to be able to do that. So, um, you know, a, a couple things on, oh, I wish to God that we would have better communications on the projects that are going on around town. I know you had a CIP meeting, okay? But at the same token, not everybody gets to see that. I've had several questions about what's going on and uh, I'm pretty astute at looking at, you know, the way things are done, I have a tremendous background in design, architecture, construction, and I don't think we get enough knowledge out to the public, okay? I was gonna talk about our, um, our shade structure uh, being uh, pushed into the Centennial Circle, and unfortunately, I'll abide by the rules, thank you. Just real quick, Linda, we, once an item starts, we don't take any more speaker cards. So once it's actually been called, correct? Correct. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, kind of a long story. It might take a few minutes. I might even be called a filibuster. But um, what Ms. Gildersleeve said um, has been parroted by a number of other people in our community. Um, it's been part of a, what they would call an AstroTurf campaign on social media where they called for people to file ethics charges against me uh, early and often, um, as many as you can. It'll make Brenda look bad. Um, there's been a lot of really harsh comparisons of me being the Joker. I guess they think I'm trying to kill Batman even, which I'm not trying to do. Um, it comes from a council member that's sitting right on this dais. Because if you, if you look at what he's called for on Alan's own page, he says something stinks in Fountain Hills. I'm talking about referendum gate, where he's comparing the referendum to Watergate and, and that this town is corrupt phony ethics sanctions, which were filed in good faith and which were upheld by an attorney that does these things. And lastly, the cover-up of developer emails. That's where it comes into me. And that's where I think people like Ms. Gildersleeve and other people have been led astray by our town council member, which they trust. They shouldn't. Prior to the council voting on the target agreement, Constituents claim that no parking agreement existed, and many of those people were from the Reclaim Our Town. I took those concerns seriously, as well as we didn't have a fire truck that was tall enough to go to the top of the building, that we had the sanitation department couldn't service the building, and that the PAD and the PUD conferred, conferred more land use rights, which they did not. 
So regarding the parking agreement, they allege the Sandor lied to the Planning and Zoning Committee and to our staff to address these concerns, like any conscientious council member would do, I requested a copy of the parking agreement between Target and Sandor, which is my right. I respected the chain of leadership by requesting our town manager and attorney to obtain a copy of the agreement so I could make a fully informed vote. This is similar to what we do in the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary. We respect the chain. I did not reach out to Sandor. I had, some, I had the chain reach out. I told them that my constituents were concerned this agreement didn't exist. And in order for me to vote with it, and if Sandor lied, I would be a no vote. And I even made this revelation to Jerry. My intent was like Ronald Reagan's trust but verify. The day before the vote, I received an email from a representative of the project asking if this was my personal email address, which I confirmed it was. Quickly, yes, because I, I get back to all my emails quickly. It's important now to know, too, that if I had been communicating and had all these communications with Sandor, then why would they even ask me if this is my correct email address? They would have already had it. They didn't. That's why they were confirming it. And I had that one communication with them. That's all. I did not quibble with them about an alternative address. My sole interest was to confirm the public that the parking agreement existed, as Sandor had agreed that it did. Regarding Mr. Eller's comment that we don't want these in the public domain, I didn't care. That wasn't my concern. My concern was did they have the agreement or not. The very fact that he was sending it to a public official made it obvious that this could be foia which it was on my personal email and which I turned over when I received the FOIA request immediately because I, did, I wasn't hiding anything. Following the, the following that night, on January 17th, I verified the existence of the written parking agreement publicly, and more importantly, I disclosed the existence of the email promptly and publicly at the same meeting. This is fully transparent. This is how the public knows about the email to begin with, and Ms. Gildersleeve is because I said it here that the email existed. I said they sent me the email. The whole process was transparent from the beginning to the end. Council member Skillicorn must be aware that these contracts contain proprietary information. Point of order. After all, Point of order, he Madam tells Mayor. us he owns a business. Hold on one sec, Brenda. Yes. The Vice Mayor. Yes. I, I just, I was, I'm curious of, you know, our ethics roles about using, you know, how you speak to out another council member in the chamber from the dais. She, well, she's responding to a criticism at call to the public, and I'm allowing that. It, it sounds awfully like, she, like she's making some accusations uh, that you know, do not uphold the values of, the, of our ethics rules. Okay. Are you almost done, Brenda? Almost. Um, could you keep it to that um, a little as much as you can so that you're defending yourself, but you're sure. not? Thank you. Anyway, the, these, these documents that they didn't want in the public domain was understandably proprietary in nature between Sandor and Target. I just want to emphasize, it was the contract documents attached to the email that the applicant wanted to keep private. It was not the email to me. That's the whole key here. They didn't care about the email to me. It was the, they tar the Target parking agreement. They didn't want their competitors and other people to see how they resolved these situations in Fountain Hills. It was a contract between two private companies that they wanted to keep secret it wasn't the fact that they sent it to me because once again, I stated it publicly. So this is really unfortunate, but that's the explanation. This was done with transparency. They sent me the email. I did it on behalf of my constituents, most of which were the people that are in Reclaim Our Town. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Thank you. We'll move on to the consent agenda, please. Um, is there a motion? Move to approve. 
I have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Council Member Toth. Aye. Council Member Friedel. Aye. Council Member Skillicorn. Aye. Council Member Grisbowski. Aye. Council Member McMahon. Aye. Vice Mayor Calavianakis. Aye. Mayor Dickey. Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Our first agenda item is item 9A, resolution 2024-15, directing the town attorney to not oppose Maricopa County Superior Court action and properly communicate such non-opposition to the court. Aaron, would you like to introduce this item, please? Mayor, I'll keep the introduction brief. I refer the council to the staff summary that provides the background of this item. Uh, we just finished up an executive session that was set for 4.30 where I provided legal advice um, in a privileged setting and subject to that attorney-client privilege, and I won't share that information here. As set forth in the staff report, staff recommends denial. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Um, we will start with speaker cards. Mayor, yes, we do have speaker cards, but also in your electronic packet, you have um, 38 comment cards, 37 against, and one for. And you do have one in writing that just wishes to comment in writing that they're against this action. Now we do have several speaker cards. And so starting out first is Crystal Cavanaugh, and on deck is Kim Wolborski. Crystal Cavanaugh, Fountain Hills. <clears throat> According to the staff report, the town clerk discovered that ROT included an incorrect serial number on the back of every petition sheet. Just to clarify, Reclaim Our Town did not include this small number. It was already present, almost like a form number, on the notary side when we received the hard copy petition on January 18th from the town clerk. We never said it was done maliciously or on purpose but the cover-up stories and misinformation that have been circulated have been concerning. And for the record, we never received a flash drive. All the front page information on the petition was filled in by Reclaim Our Town. It was correct, and that is what was viewed by those who signed the single page petitions. The back number did not impact anything at all. In fact, on tonight's executive session agenda and the regular agenda, two out of the three times the case number was listed, it was incorrect. One time it was missing an eight, the other time it was missing two zeros. But none of those numeric errors on the agenda will negate the discussion tonight. Mistakes do happen. With regards to the re resolution, as the staff reports states, it was sent to you from a member of the Republic. So let me go on the record now and say it was not Reclaim Our Town, as is the rumor, and it was not our attorney, who is Timothy Lissota. Clouding the people's understanding of this, the local Chamber of Commerce CEO sent out a very misleading email this week, misrepresenting the agenda item and reducing it down to the town is not defending their employees. And she called it an egregious ask. She opposes this resolution because the town must defend the employee and then would you want to be employed by an organization that would not defend your actions? So she asks for people to show up and speak up. Not only is that not what this resolution states, this is an overreach of her position and an inappropriate activism on her part. I would hope this council recognizes that this resolution is about standing with the citizens of Fountain Hills. It is about recognizing that in a short time period, almost 20% of the registered voters signed petitions to get this on the November ballot and to have a say for a significant rezone. As it is, the town has not actually even been defending thus far. They have, they're listed in the lawsuit, but it appears that the developer's attorneys are the ones doing the talking and the writing of the motions or replies. From what I have seen as a direct participant in this lawsuit, the town is letting the developer call the shots. The people should have a say. It would be most beneficial to the community that you are representing to reverse your course and take the side of the over 1,800 plus residents who simply want a voice in this rezone process in November. 
I am in support of the resolution, and the town should notify the court that they will not oppose the lawsuit, and they will keep counting and work for the people of Fountain Hills. Thank you. Madam Mayor, Council, staff. Um, my name is Kim Oborski, and I'm a resident of Fountain Hills, and as always, I'm incredibly grateful for that every day, even today here in the town council meeting. Um, I am speaking in favor of Resolution 2415, I got the numbers wrong, which directs the town attorney not to oppose the application for relief pending in the Maricopa County Court. If there's a legal issue that requires rewording of this resolution, I hope the council can get that done now so the resolution can be passed tonight. And I'd like to thank the council members that put it on the agenda for tonight. I was one of the citizens who helped collect the signatures for these petitions. We were able to collect enough signatures to get these measures passed in an extremely short period of time, which strongly suggests that there is a lot of support for them among the town voters. This was the first time I've collected signatures like this, so I wasn't surprised by the folks who passed by or weren't interested. After all, until I retired, that's often what I did. What surprised me was how many signers and also folks who couldn't sign because they're snowbirds and they don't vote in Fountain Hills, thanked me effusively for doing the work and how many started conversations, sometimes I had to cut them off, on how unhappy they were about the town, how the town council passed the developer's request through with almost no adjustments. Many didn't want any apartments in a solely commercial industrial area without access to parks or walkable restaurants. They were concerned about the safety of the residents and or that apartments on our busiest and fastest street and next to noisy businesses would fail and be a blot on Shea Boulevard. Many, especially those who will have the building in the view from their homes, but many others as well, were really upset about the height and size of the building. Many were worried that we would lose our only large area for commercial, especially if other apartments build a shopping center, or that this could lead to losing our industrial area, especially if eventually enough apartment dwellers complain about the noise from the businesses nearby. Many wanted the apartments to have enough parking, which they do not have. Others were still concerned about the size of the sign that's going to be in the target parking lot, and so on. It would be a huge mistake for the town to disallow these measures based on a clerical error, when clearly the will of the voters is to have them on the ballot. Thank you. Next, we have Barry Wolborski and on deck, Beth Culp. Barry Wolborski, resident of Fountain Hills, frequent flyer. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat what Crystal said when she started off because it's important. The petition sheet is signed by the voters on the front side, which contained the correct petition number and description. The back side of the sheet is never seen by the petition signer. It is only used by the signature gatherer to have signed and stamped by a notary stating that the gatherer did gather those signatures. In no way did the incorrect number on the back of the petition influence one voter ever. The council will vote on this issue tonight and they will obscure the reality of the issue with pseudo legal issues. Um, since the developer has spent no additional funds while awaiting the resolution of this issue, there will be no damages in a lawsuit. What I understand about lawsuits is no damages, no validity in the lawsuit. But there are two types of council members before you tonight. Those who value and respect the voters who are their constituents and those that don't. Those who don't will give lengthy legal and emotional rationalizations for their negative vote. But there's another ballot coming this summer. That ballot is for the election of town council members and the mayor. And by this summer, all the rationalizations will be forgotten. But rest assured, those on the council who voted to disrespect the voters and stifle their right to voice their opinions in an important town issue will be well remembered. Good evening, my name is Beth Culp and I'm a resident of Fountain Hills. I can't believe that we're actually having this hearing. Um, I can't believe that three members of this body agreed to put a resolution on the agenda that would direct the town attorney to act unethically by failing to defend litigation in which the town, the mayor, 
six council members and the town clerk are named as individual defendants. If the resolution passes and the litigation is not defended, a default judgment will be entered. The town, the council members, the mayor, the town clerk will be deemed to have admitted every single one of the many false allegations in that complaint. Rot would then claim that's an entitled to the relief it is requested. The town clerk would be ordered to accept the signature sheets, which on their face, I'm sorry, do not comply with the requirements of the statute. The statute very clearly and pointedly says that the petition number must appear on the front page and on the back page. The correct petition number indisputably was not on the back page. And it's, this council doesn't have the discretion to overlook that statutory requirement. The town clerk doesn't have the discretion to overlook that. So if the town clerk were ordered to accept the faulty signature sheet, she would be essentially being ordered to do something that was illegal. This is not something that you can simply say, oh, everyone makes mistakes. This mistake was fatal to that petition, to that referendum. You agreed to conduct your official affairs in such a manner as to give a clear impression that you cannot be improperly influenced in the performance of your official duties. You agreed to represent the official policies and positions of the town council. A majority of the elected representatives of this council voted in favor of the zoning change that allowed for the Four Peaks project to go forward. But rather than support this official decision, three of you appear to be poised to bend over backwards to support the efforts of a vocal minority, and make no mistake about it, they are a minority. And in terms of that, it's important to recall that when they were out getting signatures, one of the narratives that they employed, and I, this is a quote, the zoning change would lead to the active recruitment of poor people of color to live in the community. I urge you to reject this re illegal act. Thank you. Next, we have Matthew Corrigan, and then on deck, Betsy Lavoy. Mayor, council members, Matthew Corrigan, resident Fountain Hills. I stand in support of 2024-15. On December 15th, 1791, our American founding fathers, with great wisdom and insight and foresight, ratified the amendments to the Constitution. Amendment 1 reads this way, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or of the people to peaceably assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. In a very short amount of time, many concerned citizens willingly offered their free volunteer time and energy to circulate a petition and petition sheets in an effort to send the rezone decision, which had been decided by four council members, to a ballot referendum so that the voters of Fountain Hills could decide their future. Over 1,800 residents of Fountain Hills signed the petition sheets in order that their right to vote could be protected. And current zoning ordinances and the maintained ordinances which had protected the town of Fountain Hills from very high density housing in the past. Again, a member of the, of the public, not a slim majority of the town council, sent the town a draft resolution directing the town attorney not to oppose the lawsuit. The town attorney should not oppose the lawsuit and should inform the court of this. This allows the town clerk to continue her statutory review process 
and forward signatures to the county recorder for verification. Not only do people have the right to be heard to express their grievances by the petition process, but that process should be allowed to go forward. Our founding fathers believed this so strongly that they included this in the First Amendment to the Constitution. We should defend this right and not oppose it. Approve resolution, revolu sorry, resolution 2024-15 and let the people have the right to decide this zoning future for our town of Fountain Hills. It's that important. It's an issue which should stand on principle and the Constitution, not accusations, rumor, gossip, innuendo, insult at times. We're bigger than that, I think. I hope we are. Thank you. Good evening, Betsy Lavoie, Fountain Hills resident. I stand before you tonight to express our strong opposition to the proposed resolution that would direct the town attorney to refrain from opposing the lawsuit filed by ROT against the town, the town council members, the town clerk, and the project developers. It is concerning that this resolution would essentially condone an attempt to circumvent established procedures and undermine the democratic process. The actions taken by ROT, including the circulation of petition sheets with incorrect serial numbers, are unacceptable and undermine the integrity of our local governance. The town clerk, in accordance with statutory mandates, acted appropriately. It is her duty to ensure the accuracy and validity of such petitions, and her, act her actions should be supported, not undermined. Allowing ROT to proceed with their lawsuit unchecked sets a dangerous precedent. It sends a message that political action committees can disregard rules and regulations without consequence. This not only erodes the public trust in our institutions, but also creates a breeding ground for further abuse of the system. Furthermore, by not opposing the lawsuit, the town would be neglecting its responsibility to uphold the decisions made by duly elected officials. The rezoning requests were approved by the town council after careful consideration and considerable public input. Allowing the lawsuit to proceed uncontested would undermine the authority of this council and diminish the significance of your decisions. I urge you to reject the proposed re resolution and to stand firm to support the town clerk and the integrity of our local governance process. Let us uphold the rule of law and ensure that decisions made by our elected representatives are respected and upheld. Thank you. Next, we have Tammy Bell and on deck, Chris Enos. Tammy Bell, resident of Fountain Hills, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, and staff. I'm thankful to be able to express my opposition to this proposed resolution. As a resident, I value and desire the trustworthiness of our town attorney and our staff to defend the process and conduct their due diligence when situations like this surface. Of course, our residents have a right to be heard. The process of the referendum should not be allowed to proceed, though, if frustrated by errors. If found, all errors should be discovered transparently without deceit or hidden agendas. Denying this motion is of significant importance to uphold the integrity of our town staff and governance. A substantial number of residents have been involved regarding both sides of this town matter. Our town staff must now be given the support and the opportunity to provide evidence and explanation to all of those concerned with this process and deemed it where the, um, she deemed referendum failure. As a resident, I want to be assured that my town attorney, the town staff, and elected officials are following proper procedures and act with complete accountability and transparency. It appears that there's discrepancies on both sides. Both Crystal stood here saying there were there were discrepancies, and the town clerk has said so as well. I don't understand why we would deny them the right to defend that and to be able to show the evidence that they have. So I am asking that and urging you to reject this resolution in order to defend staff and the process and allow them to display evidence for this local matter. Thank you.
I was a little closer to the front that time. Okay. Sorry to take up your time, but this is important. This is not a resolution in for or against the original rezoning. Everybody of good sound mind and good reasoning can have different positions on that. That's fine. This is about representative government. This basically acknowledges that, yeah, you took an oath. An oath basically was to be a representative for the people of this town. Um, some of you I had conversations with in the path, past about this. And in this case, you have legal arguments. Legal arguments can be made. Uh, you don't have to make those arguments to say that the town is not going to be in a position to take a position on those legal arguments. Sandor has its attorneys. They got a lot of attorneys, well-paid ones. I've met some of them. And I can tell you, you are the only thing that people have. They don't have high-paid attorneys. They have you. And 1,800 people have indicated a voice that they want to say in what happens in this particular proposition. So again, you may be for it and just acknowledge, okay, we acknowledge the fact that 1,800 people really want to have a say in this and we want to acknowledge that as well. Don't capitulate to the detriment of the town. That's not about, this is not what this is about. Rather, empower your town attorney to seek a resolution, a settlement. And in that settlement, you can protect the interests of the town employees, uh, all of whom, you're all, you're all good employees, by the way. I like every one of you. Um, the, the town can be protected, and at the same time, you can allow the court to decide, after Sandor makes its arguments, the court to decide versus the plaintiff's attorney whether or not all those legalistic arguments about numbers and back or front have merit. It's just your position that you're saying, we recognize 1,800 people have a right to have a say in this matter. We as, <clears throat> we as council people have a duty to represent those people's interests, much as a lawyer represents a client. And you, as the representative of the people then, are merely saying, hey, court, do, your, do whatever you're gonna do on this matter, but we're not gonna have a say in it, we're not gonna depend on it, subject to receiving adequate assurances a protection for every member of this council, every employee of the town and the town itself. That's what this resolution does. It doesn't take a position on the proposal. It allows the people, may or may not, after the lawsuit is complete, possibly then to have a say in their own town. That's what you're here to do. You're here to protect the interests of the people. I respectfully submit that's all this resolution does. And we have one final speaker, and that's Ed Stizza. Good evening again. We've got a big question. Why don't we back this all up to when this all first started? And um, I'd like to know why the people that voted for this project want this so badly. Okay, whether it's our chamber, the people up there that voted for it, there's something to be said about that. There's also something to be said about, I watched the process of the signatures getting signed, and I know for a fact that there are several people in this room that tried to stop it. And for you guys to just circumvent this and not listen to the voice of the public on this project, which has its problems, None of you that voted yes listened to P&Z. They were way more knowledgeable on this and gave you all the information that you needed and you pushed it through. And you pushed it through fast. So you wonder why the public that has some common sense actually is questioning that? Why don't you answer those questions? Back up a little bit. But you should certainly allow the public to be able to make this decision because this has gone that far, and it's your own fault. So somebody tell me why this project is so important to Fountain Hills. Answer that. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're done with um, the public comment aspect, so the council is free to discuss. 
Anybody want to uh, start, Councilman? Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I just want to make a note just so people know the kind of the order of sequence and how things happen. Uh, about a month ago, a constituent reached out, had this idea, this resolution to potentially stand down. And uh, I, you know, I did request to put it on the agenda. Uh, I do look at this as a situation that I think a judge is going to decide no matter what. Uh, developers are going to get involved, and they have uh, plenty of experience suing and uh, being in court. And attorneys are expensive, and you know, rather, um, I'd rather not have the town be involved in the uh, the legal mess of this. Uh, the ideas of uh, us paying for our attorney to defend this is expensive. That money could be used elsewhere. We've got a you know very large backlog for roads. Um, you know why why go ahead with this when the developer is going to pay for themselves? Uh, and that's the reason I've kind of pushed for this, and I think it's, it's going to be decided in court anyways. Um, you know, with or without our involvement, uh, the facts are going to come out, the judge is going to decide, and uh, either way. And uh, I don't know why we have to be that involved in it. And, you know, frankly, uh, the people that, that signed that petition, circulate that petition, they're my constituents too. So not only did one of my constituents come to me and ask me to put this resolution on the, on the agenda, uh, my constituents are also part of the process. Uh, and I think that's a pretty good, darn good reason. Uh, and frankly, um, I represent the people. I do not represent the developers. Thank you, Mayor. When I first heard about this resolution, I thought it was a good idea to have a discussion on it and to give some direction to maybe seek a different resolution with this. So I'm in favor of the resolution. I'm in favor of the 1,800 plus residents of this town that voiced their interest in having this go to a vote. I don't think it's throwing any town employees under the bus for us to seek um, some sort of resolution with, with this lawsuit and to have the town. Uh, I have full faith and credit, credibility with Linda Mendenhall and everybody sitting up here. So this isn't a slam to anybody. It's not disparaging anybody. But I think, um, and it's not a partisan thing. There were a lot of people that I know that, that were on the other side of where I stand that signed this, uh, this petition for this thing. I wasn't involved with it. Um, I haven't had any conversations with it, but I, I'm in favor of the resolution because I, I think it's something that we should explore and see if there's a better, a better way to handle this. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I'm kind of surprised this one made the agenda too. Um, you know, I'm a lawyer, I think everyone knows that. This country um, just affords people process, due process. That's what it affords. It doesn't guarantee outcome. It doesn't even guarantee justice. If you're going to court, don't look for justice, right, Chris? Because a lot of times you won't find it there. Um, there is a process for handling this. We don't live in a country that has a direct democracy and that the constituents vote for every issue. We have a process that you vote for your representatives. You give them suggestions, and they have a lot of information that they use to do what they want, it, what they deem is the, in the best interest for the town. In this, in this case, the uh, Target Center revitalization project to revitalize that section of town is, I think, critically important to the future of Fountain Hills, which is, that's why I voted for it. Um, that being said, that this kind of comes up every four years with the Electoral College too, by the way. Is it fair for a, president, a presidential election to come down to who got the more votes or who won the Electoral College? It's kind of the same principle. There are laws here the laws direct that we shall be represented by counsel. Now, I've got the, the lawsuit here on my little phone. And if you want to break it down to its very basics, it's reclaim our town versus Jenny, Brenda, Alan, Peggy, Hannah, Blue, Jerry, and Rachel. And Linda, of course. Don't, don't forget Linda. That's what it comes down to. It's people. We're being sued because we represent the town. And I'll tell you one thing. <laughs> I, I don't want to lay down my lawyer and say, you know what, take, take a break and we'll just take our chances out there. It's a process. He'll represent the town. Sandor will represent Sandor. Our interests don't always align. 
And that's kind of the way I look at it. Now, interestingly enough, on the resolution, it says, we'll be frustrated due to what may have been an inadvertent clerical error. Like, come on, it's no big deal. It's just a little clerical error. Let's go back. That's ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> to say that we're not going to get voted into office because we're respecting the law is ridiculous. It's just like the guy that came up here and said, if you issue me a speeding ticket, I'm not going to vote for you. I think that's what he said. Um, we just follow the law here, regardless of the consequences. Now, this argument about inadvertent clerical errors, this harkens back to a couple months ago when uh, Frank Quinn and Fountain Hills Roasters had four applications for signs that he wanted to build around Fountain Hills, and he got two of the signs in on time, and then his clerical, his manager, took ill, had to be rushed to the hospital, and they didn't get the other two filed. And so he came to, to me and I went to the mayor and we put that on the agenda and I asked for a hardship exception. I said, he was gonna file those, but there's a hardship exception because it, it, she took L. So can we go ahead and process those two applications? Of which this council said, no, we don't make exceptions. We follow the rules. I, you guys were really clear on that. One of the speakers, was the chairman of ROT that very same night, interestingly enough. She described the process that went through planning and zoning and went to council. And then she looked at me and she said, she didn't like the exception rule of me letting Frank fill out his two signs. She said, if you start giving exceptions like this, where does it end? Who gets special treatment? Who does not? This is directly quoted from the transcript of that town council meeting. What's the criteria, criteria to get special exemption? How many days after the deadline is acceptable? Is it two days past the deadline or a month? This isn't some archaic out of date ordinance on the books that hasn't been looked at in years. It was just passed in October, November, kind of like here. Would you allow me to put up a beautiful electronic orange and blue fashing reclaim our town sign if I now requested it after the expiration date? I think you get my point, Crystal said. This is a salient point here. She said, we have ordinances to provide consistent guidelines to follow regarding what is acceptable here in Fountain Hills and what is not. This is nothing personal here against these two applicants, but they're past the deadline, sorry. Uh, okay. So we're going to follow the process to the end, which means we're going to get defended by our town attorney. It'll go to a court. They're looking at it right now as far as who made the mistake. They'll make a determination and we'll go from there. But as, as far as taking leniency on an inadvertent clerical error, I think that ship has sailed. Thank you. Madam Mayor, I just have a quick question. Are we going to continue just calling out residents and constituents like this? Is this, is this a new policy of ours to call residents by name and, and mock them and attack them? I don't think anybody's being mocked. You feel mocked being quoted? I'm sorry. I don't want to. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do this. But no, I think we're trying to defend something. We've heard a lot of things being flung our way, and I think that we have the ability to respond to them. Madam Mayor, I think that the point you, is that... Uh, as, the, the, and this is not oh. the first time this has happened either. Madam Mayor, I, just, I don't think this has anything to do with the person that was called out in the audience, though. This is a different constituent asked to have this. I don't, I, I don't see even the connection. It's illogical to, to bring it into it because there, there isn't a connection there. There's a connection, and I allowed it. Are, are you insinuating that there's a connection, Mayor? Uh, excuse me. Uh, who's next? I will. Councilwoman. Thank you. I'm listening to what everybody said. And the essence of this is a strict compliance state statute by the circulators of the petition and by our town clerk. The fact of the matter is, is we are being sued. Linda's named in the lawsuit. I'm named in the lawsuit. And all of fellow council members are. 
who doesn't think when you're sued, what is your first thought? To defend yourself. It's a fundamental right. Even criminals, the criminally accused, have a fundamental right to legal counsel to present their case and defend themselves. Our code even recognizes this right and the need for the town and the town council to have legal counsel in defense of lawsuits brought against them. Under our ordinance 31-2, the town attorney shall ensure the town is represented by legal counsel in the prosecution or the defense of all suits, actions, or causes where the town is a party. If the three council members who put this on the agenda choose to not be represented, that's their choice. I choose to be represented and defend myself. To not provide a legal defense for the town, to me, would expose the town to undue financial risk and send a strong message to our staff that we do not, as a governing body, support them or protect their, their actions as town employees in a lawsuit as mandated by our own ordinance. And to direct our town attorney to not defend us in this action, to me, will be breaking that law. This is an unfortunate lawsuit that needs to be fully adjudicated. The facts heard in a court of law, not by a default judgment for lack of just merely not defending the lawsuit. We are a party to the lawsuit. And like you, I have a right to defense. And I choose that. And I think it's unethical and inappropriate for us to consider otherwise. Thank you. Anything else? Councilman. I had a couple people come to me and ask me if I would ask Councilman Skillicorn to recuse himself today. And while I appreciate the question coming to me, I had an opportunity to talk with our town attorney and we don't see it as a recusable situation. It may have the appearance of a conflict of interest because he requested that this come before us and his attorney is the same as the attorney that is representing the people that are suing the town. I just felt the need to get that out there because I actually haven't even contacted the people that asked me to ask him to recuse himself. himself. So I, it's not gonna happen. We, I will not be asking him to do it, but I did want to acknowledge that it does give the appearance of a conflict of interest. That being said, it makes zero sense to me why we would not want to defend ourselves. We are named individually. We are named as a town. We conducted an in-house investigation. We need to support ourselves and our staff. And I'm pretty sure my personal attorney is watching right now. It just makes zero sense why, I wouldn't wanna, why we wouldn't want to defend ourselves. And I appreciate everybody coming and speaking tonight and the public comment cards that came in. But I will definitely be, I'm actually ready to make a motion to deny. We have a motion and a second, but we can continue discussion if you'd like. I'd like to say a couple things. Um, some of the stuff that we heard from the uh, f folks that were speaking about representing the people, we, we do represent the people, but the people don't agree all the time with each other. I have a, um, a feeling that there are a lot of people who support 
the development and, uh, you know, are upset about empty storefronts and would be in favor of a $67 million investment into our town that would also uh, probably revitalize some extra businesses and also supply some very badly needed housing. I feel um, like I had plenty of information to make a reasoned decision at that time. I knew, I watched planning zoning. I heard everybody come up and speak one way or the other here. I did meet with the developers as we all did, or I believe almost all of us did on uh, right here in town hall, all open, and um, made that decision that I thought this was a good project. You know, in the past I've made decisions not to support projects, but I did this one and it passed four to three. So I know we're trying to keep that part out of it, um, what it's about, but I also felt the need to respond to being uh, that we don't represent the people because the people have different opinion about this. And so, and the people elected all of us to make decisions when times like this come. And that's the way that decision came down. This right now though, and I'm gonna ask maybe Aaron, um, does the state require the correct serial number on both sides of a referendum petition? Because a referendum petition is trying to reverse legal action that an elected body took. So it does have a lot more scrutiny on it. Is that something that is irrefutable? Mayor and council, yes. So the, the both sides of the petition, whether we feel that's important or not, that's a requirement. Does the state require any clerk or anybody that's in charge of the petitions to void petitions that do not have the correct serial number on both sides. Mayor and Council, yes. So that's like the little minor, or the little narrow part that has nothing to do with the apartments. And that's what you're, we're being asked to tell our clerk to send those petitions to the state or the recorder, I can't remember which, Secretary of State, with the, in, uh, and, and again, the petitions are available and they have one s number on one side and a variety of two numbers on some of the back sides. So it's, that's irrefutable that those petitions do not conform that way. Why would we ask our, anybody to forward those to the state when we know that, that they need to be forwarded? We will not ask, I will not ask a staff or ourselves to ignore the state statute. Clearly this isn't about protection of free speech. Those 1,800 people absolutely had the right to want to have a say in this, but there was clearly an error. Now who made the error? There was clearly an error. So the result of that error is that those petitions needed to be voided. And now what we're going through is a decision to say we're gonna send them anyway. I mean, it just is, it's just not something I'm willing to do. Um, and I think that, again, some of, some of the, I've been on the other side of this with petitions that I, that were statewide. So it's probably, you know, thousands of signatures and they were thrown out because it was stapled wrong. It was upside down on the back or whatever. It's, the legislature wrote it that way on purpose and made it very, very difficult. And you know, the, the signatures can't go under the line and the date can't just say 2024 and you can't put FH for Fountain Hills. It's very annoying, but it's the way it is. And I'm not going to stand by and allow this, cl this undefined clerical error because it doesn't, and just try to, to try to say that we won't go forward and, and defend that. Um, there's no way I'm doing that. So um, is, does anybody have any other comments? Yes, Hannah. I'll keep it short and sweet. I did want to say that when our public, and I don't mean to put words in the mouth of the public, please forgive me, but when you do come and speak about representing the people and the voice of the people, I think part of that, Mayor, is that all of the people for or against would have had the opportunity to vote on that referendum. And if it were to make it on the ballot, which 
is a big if, no matter what happens with this resolution tonight, that lawsuit still gets decided as stated by a member of the public. Again, if it were to make it on the ballot, everyone gets to vote on that. So that is the representation of everyone. Um, I'll also <laughs> remind the vice mayor that I did vote with her on the, on the signs um, to make the exception. So I guess I'm staying consistent tonight. <laughs> Mayor, just one more comment. Um, I think it's been said here that by doing this resolution that we don't support the town staff. That couldn't be further from the truth. This will be adjudicated. We aren't asking for a dismissal. And it's not unethical for us to ask for uh, some sort of other resolution. That's not unethical. That's called negotiations. For a town that's always so concerned and worried about lawsuits like with the sober home and detox and other things that we've gone through, um, it's amazing to me that we don't look for a resolution on this that would step us out of this lawsuit and still protect our town staff and council. There's ways to do that, and again, it's called negotiation. So we're so concerned about lawsuits in this town on every time we turn around we don't want to be sued. We don't want to be sued. Um, I think it's important that we look for ways to get to get out of lawsuits. I don't disagree with that. So anyway, that's that's all I have to say. Um, thank you. I guess I have to just uh, I just don't understand how asking her to send petitions that we know are void to the Secretary of State is supporting. And you don't you don't have to answer, but I just don't. I, I do see it as not supporting our staff. Uh, Councilwoman? Also, again, this is a strict compliance statute. It needs to be adjudicated in a court of law. The judge has to decide it. I don't even know. I don't even know for sure, but it can even be settled. It's a strict compliance statute. It's before the court. And I do see it as not supporting our staff, among other things. We have a motion and a second. Uh, are we ready to vote? Roll call, please. And the motion is to deny. Council Member Fidel. Nay. Council Member Skillicorn. No to deny. Council Member Grzybowski. Aye. Council Member McMahon. Aye. Council Member Toth. Nay. Vice Mayor Kalavianakis. Aye. Mayor Dickey. Aye. Thank you. It passes very much. three to four. Thank, yes, three four to four. Four to three. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Move on to our next item, which is a um, subdivision item regarding hillside protection and fire safety. Rachel? Uh, just a quick introduction. John's going to walk us through this one, but this is a result of the request of uh, Councilman. Dell, I believe. You brought this forward a while back. Um, so this is the culmination of those efforts. Good evening, Mayor and Council. As uh, the town manager said, uh, this is a item that uh, the town council asked staff to look into with regard to uh, helping protect uh, properties under construction from fire dangers, as well as uh, to uh, look at uh, developed areas that may be impacted uh, because of hillside protection requirements and overgrowth that could occur in those areas that could result in increased fire danger. We held uh, two meetings uh, with an ad hoc committee to consider uh, some changes to our codes to address those issues, and the committee supports these changes as they are being presented this evening. What's being proposed is that we amend uh, Section 5.04B1 of our uh, subdivision ordinance that provides some uh, exemptions to uh, hillside protection requirements by adding a new D, and I won't read the full language there, but basically it provides for an additional 10-foot buffer uh, outside the, the, the uh, required uh, uh, non-disturbance area so that uh, a developer, if they choose to and feels there's a need, can uh, clear an, a little extra area uh, of any of the uh, potential fire hazards uh, so that it reduces that danger within that area uh, nearest where the construction activities uh, are occurring. 
would you like us to ask questions as we go along? Sure. Okay, good, because that way I don't forget. Uh, <laughs> so they're accommodating me. So we're asking them to clear the vegetation and then revegetate. I completely understand why we're asking them to clear the vegetation, but I feel like then insisting that they now go back and put plants in, these are things that are already native. They're gonna automatically come back in anyway, the way the wind blows. Why are we insisting that they go back and replant? Uh, Mayor, council member, that amount of replanting would uh, depend a lot upon the specific situation, how much overgrowth there really was uh, and how much clearing they feel like they need to do. Uh, so it's not necessarily a one for one uh, revegetation that would occur, but something that would bring it back to just the basic standard uh, that we'd see uh, in the desert in that area. We're cons we have fire concerns. So replanting vegetation in an area that we've just had them remove it, there's still gonna be the same fire concerns. Mayor, council member, the fire concerns are a little bit heightened during construction because of some of the work that occurs, particularly the hot work or the, the, uh, the cutting of the metals and so forth as they're building retaining walls. Uh, those uh, uh, are occurring right on the edge of uh, you know, that uh, clear desert or non-clear desert. Whereas after the house is built, most of those activities aren't really right there at that edge anymore. Okay, I'm just, I'm not a fan of asking them to remove it and then going back and asking them to put it back in. I just feel like we're adding expense and, and time and fire issues. I think some members of the committee want to answer, Jerry? So it's not just that, it's taking out a lot of the dead stuff that's already there that's a fire hazard. So it, like John said, it won't be one for one, but what it does is it removes the liability of grinding and iron work and that kind of thing of starting an additional fire up there in, in rough terrain where we, do, we can't always get access to get equipment and vehicles in there. But uh, there's a lot of dead material that has to be removed um, that is a fire hazard right now. Is, is that right, John? That's correct. Yeah. So again, when they get done then with the project, they revegetate and some of it will be a little bit more uh, fire resistant type of uh, planning that goes in there. Also, um, the builders who are part of the committee, they suggested this. They, they wanted this to occur in the manner that it did so that there would be revegetation for their own reasons. And like Jerry said, it's mainly to get rid of the undergrowth that builds up. But again, on behalf of their homeowners association and the developers, they wanted it to be revegetated after it was removed. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And specifically the vegetation, the um, invasive non-native buffalo grass is what's flammable. So when that's taken down, uh, that's what gives, that it what helps prevent the, 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 the fire hazard, really. The native species are not as flammable as the invasive stuff. Um, so even though I do get the idea, like well, why would we plant stuff that could burn again, so sagebrush, some of the other things, I don't, I don't know if I, I see them realistically planting a lot there, but just eliminating the buffalo grass is important. Uh, now, if we're really t thinking about maintaining the hillsides, having sagebrush grow there instead of buffalo grass would be beneficial, and then if the sagebrush is actually growing, the um, grass seed wouldn't have as you know, open dirt basically to, to grab onto. But the, really that's the important part is the invasive, you know, very flammable buffalo grass to get rid of. And it makes a lot of sense to get rid of it. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I, I like this, Jerry. I think this is good public policy. Um, could, is there a way that we could do a carve out though for existing plants that are indigenous that are alive that, that we don't have to take those down, but just the dead vegetation? Would that, would that be something that you could live with? Well, if, if there's something kind of to what we're sharing with saying, if, there, if there's live vegetation, do, do we have to remove that if that we're going to use that for the landscape? They're not going to be out there clear cutting the desert. Okay. No, that's not the intent of this. The intent is just to get rid of the flammables. Um, especially around the areas where they're putting up a fence and they're grinding and welding and that kind of thing. And then they'll go back in and do their landscaping as appropriate. And again, this will be monitored by most of the HOAs as well. 
so that would avoid like saguaros and yeah. Uh, and oh yeah. All, all oh, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. I just you can't make touch sure. those anyway. Those are those oh, of course, are protected of course. by the I state. I just use that in the obvious example, but yeah, that that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, Mayor. <laughs> um, so the. Um, other change that we are proposing is a little bit uh, further down in the ordinance with regard to uh, just the rest of the uh, community that are covered by the hillside protection easements and after construction. Over a period of time, uh, those areas can get overgrown, uh, can get an accumulation of dead materials and so forth where some fire uh, dangers could occur. So we're proposing to add some language, uh, a new section H. Uh, that uh, gives the fire marshal the opportunity to work with a homeowner that has a hillside protection easement in place to look at any fire dangers that have accumulated around their property and allow some selective clearing on the property uh, up to 100 feet uh, from the structure uh, and then um, uh, get it to a state where it won't have quite the same level of danger. This doesn't, again, allow for clear cutting. It's very selective uh, and uh, help reduce that risk uh, in the in the area, one of the concerns was brought up uh, in the desert uplands areas. As uh, more houses uh, get built, it becomes more concerning. Uh, if a fire does occur in the area, there's more property that can be damaged. So we want to take this extra step uh, to try to balance the, the desire to keep a good uh, native desert look to the community, but still protect homes as they get built. Did you see a typo in there? Violation in the last line. Yeah, I see that now. <laughs> Thanks. And I believe that's it. Thank you very much. Yes, we, so I don't know if you want to kind of point out that there was a, a nice committee there. I don't, Jerry, do you want to kind of take a little bit? Yeah, John was on the committee, myself, Peggy. Um, who else from town staff? There were a couple of Paul Edward, John Wesley, Peggy McMahon, Dan, David Janover, David Ott, Mike Winters. Rachel, Jerry, Peter, Brent, Michael Gant was in and out on a couple of the meetings, Steve Argo and Dennis Brown and Jack Wigley. So, so we had a good, a good smattering of people from all over the town and people that are involved with this. So, and again, it'll be under the uh, fire marshal, his uh, recommendation too. So also with this, let me explain one other thing real quick and then I'll make a motion to adopt this. Yes, okay, so let me, let me add one other thing too. So some of these properties have got trees that are a little bit further out that are dead. Again, the fire marshal's gonna recommend if those trees are a hazard or a, or a real fire hazard, um, he'll recommend that they be removed, um, which is a new thing for this, uh, this ordinance as well. Do we have any speaker cards for, the, for this item? Mayor, we do not, but we do have one written comment for you in your packet, and they are for this item. <laughs> the only question I have as a prior insurance person is, have we contacted, we have a major insurance carrier that's based out of Phoenix. Have we talked to anybody from there to see if this is actually going to help with the insurance rates and with the cancellation problem that we have? Mayor, I can't remember, uh, staff is not directly. Uh, so. I, I can address part of that. Um, I did reach out to our um, state representatives because we had heard from a number of residents that, this, that the state of Arizona had been declared a fire, a fire zone or of some sort. They did some research on it and they couldn't find any truth to that. So as far as that goes, um, there was a ma one major insurance carrier that did leave the state. I think it was uh, Chubb, um, for whatever reason. Um, not sure if that was related to this or not, but we having this ordinance on the books, uh, people can go to their insurance company and say, hey, we've taken steps in this town to minimize the effects of fire within a certain perimeter of our property. So I think that'll be a big benefit. Um, so again, we'll check. We'll keep checking with our state reps to see if they find out anything about that declaration that was made. Because we heard that some people's uh, insurance premiums had gone up 40, 60, 80 percent. So we want to try and minimize that for every resident in the town. Because generally speaking, their biggest asset is their property. So we want to do what we can to aid, protect it, and b make sure they can get insurance for it. 
With that, I'll, I'll move to adopt Ordinance 24-09. Second. Council of Corn, did you have any other comment? <laughs> Your light was on. I finally put, paid attention. Oh, okay, thank you. Roll call, please. First, I need to know who won the um, oh. second. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, Council Member Skillicorn. Yes. Council Member Grisbowski. Aye. Council Member McMahon. Aye. Council Member Toth. Aye. Council Member Friedel. Aye. Vice Mayor Cal Calavianakis. Aye. Mayor Dickey. Aye. Passes Thank you and the committee for all your work. I, now, I told you to do the, um, the vote count, and then I keep cutting you off. <laughs> but that was unanimous, so we, we got that one down. Our next item is wayfinding signs. Uh, Rachel? Uh, Mayor and Council, this item, the wayfinding signs, has been a very long process. Um, some of you were on the council when it was introduced. Some of you may be less familiar with it, so I think Justin's going to review it. But we also have Amanda here tonight. Um, obviously, signage and um, directing folks into our town, into our highlighted areas, is a big uh, discussion piece. So I know Justin has really spearheaded a lot of this, but Amanda is here to talk from the economic side if needed. With that, Justin, take us away. Madam Mayor, Council Members, thank you for the opportunity. This process started in earnest in 2017. At that time, the town secured the services of a vendor that prepared a set of plans. The preparation of those plans included meetings with staff, open house, several visits to the council for their approval on the process. Eventually, it came to fruition. At that time, uncertainty in regards to the economy, the project was put aside. Staff was asked some years later to bring it back, and we did so. As part of that, we were asked to place it out and get some bids for the plans that we had received. We followed that direction and did so. On average, they were around $300,000 a piece. This was in 2021. At that time, again, it was decided due to uncertainty in the economy that the project would be deferred. Once again, we entered back into the foray. This time, while we were taking a look at it, we noted that the original design is really based off of California standards. In that particular case, the architect or designer prepares all the necessary documents and the concepts, but the onus for all the engineering, wind loading, and everything else is placed on the contractor that bids on it. Having discussion with the town management, we decided the best thing to do was come back to the council, ask for some funding, and have an engineering firm and a fabrication firm work on it and bring it to fruition. So now we have a complete set of documents that includes all the necessary engine, engine, engineering and also includes the concepts that were originally approved with a minimal amount of changes. With that, we'll get started with our little PowerPoint. Please feel free as we're moving through here to stop and ask questions so we can do the best we can to answer any of them that you may have. There are primarily three types of signs. The large ones known as the V10s, which are the vehicle um, directional primary. These are the types of signs that would go out on Shea. The V12s, which are the secondary. This would be Fountain Hills Boulevard, Saguaro, Palisades, those area. And lastly, the V15s. These are the smaller signs that would be placed on the minor collectors, major collectors, and local streets leading to one location or another. This is the V10. These are the ones that would be out on Shea. A lot of information on this slide in regards to the height. Please note that the original plans included material sizes that were not typical 
of the industry and required specialty sizing. When we went back and looked at it, we opted to choose readily available off-the-shelf sizes for the sheathing. The front sheathing on this would obviously be aluminum, and the back on it was originally called for weathered steel. In this particular case, there is an option between weathered steel and or properly applied uh, powder coating or painting, and you would have the same effect. However, the signs would not be rusty. They would just would appear to be. Justin, um, the one before this had numbers underneath. Are those the number of signs you think that we need of each type? Madam Mayor, in fact, the, this, the plan that we're showing you tonight calls for seven of the V10s, 16 of the V12, and 17 of the V15. These are the V12 signs, just slightly smaller, but not much. These types of signs, again, would be on Palisades, Fountain Hills Boulevard, and Saguaro. A lot of information here. Justin, will you go over those numbers one more time, how many we need of each? Council member, I certainly will. We have seven of the very large ones, 16 of the large but not as large, and 17 of the smaller ones. Do you know how many wayfinding signs we have now? Like around? At this time, Madam Mayor, we have very few of the remaining brown ones. As they become damaged over the years, we've simply removed them. I don't have a total count of that at this time. I can tell you that two of the three signs, the big blue and white ones out on Shea still remain. However, the third one was struck and at a cost of a couple of thousand dollars to have it repaired, it mm. was decided above my pay grade that wasn't a, a good plan at this time. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, yeah, since we're kind of jumping ahead with questions, I just had a quick one for you. Um, I, t I told you I just went to the East Coast for a, a week, and I spent half my time looking at public restrooms and wayfinding signs <laughs> because I knew we were going to be addressing this tonight. Um, the, the color palette, I know you're using that. Is that going to be subject to change? Madam Mayor, uh, Madam Vice Mayor, in fact, it is. So this was a, the colors originally chosen by the elected body at that time and then revisited and agreed to again at that time. So that's why we're here tonight. We want to get your opinion not only on the color but the location and the format, and then there are some other questions in the very end related to the town center signs, um, because of rebranding that is now known as the downtown. So we'll we'll get some direction on that as well. I think it's important to note that any substantial change beyond what we have right here will require an amendment to the contract, and then we'll come back to council for the design changes. And again, I, I use substantial. Just changing the colors right now are not that challenging, but any, any major changes are certainly gonna require additional funding. These are the fee 15. These are the types that you would see approaching your destination. El Lago, La Montana, Parkview, Avenue of the Fountains. Any questions related to this one? This is the destination list. So these are where these signs are directing people to, the location. And these are listed in one form or another on these signs depending on their location. And I think it's important to note that the Weekapa Resort was an ask by the then president of the Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation and two councils agreed to add them because they're our partners and our neighbors. I just have a question about that though. Um, it seems to be, I think, the only thing that's named by like, um, you know, brand name or whatever you want to call it. Um, Cause we have a golf course but we don't have Desert Canyon or whatever. So I wonder to be consistent if we put if there's a way to put resort casino or something like that 
um, especially in part of the discussion a long time ago had to do with, um, you know, if something changed na their name or they changed owners or something, and they and we ended up with a sign up that said, you know, whatever. Um, I don't want to make something up, you know, little cupcake shop or something, and then they turned turned it into a different name. So I wondered about just saying resort casino golf course or something like that, rather than the actual name. Madam Mayor, if we can get a majority to agree on something similar to that, we can, we can certainly, is that what you would like to see is, is a resort casino? So the resort in this particular context represents another resort off of Palisades and Eagle Ridge Drive. The Wikipa is separate, though. So the Wikipa Resort, we could certainly work that language. What would you like to see, Madam Mayor? I understand the argument about the brand name, um, but I also think we have a brand and image too. And I don't, I don't know if I want casino on our signs. So were, were you just saying that this is um, that this is not for the casino? This is for something else, the or just the resort? resort. Fact a resort. We did not use the the previous councils did not select casino. Instead, they focused on the fact that it was a resort. So the one right before it just says resort. That is a, a nearby one that would point you directly west on Eagle Ridge Drive to a destination. I, I understand the concern, but I think they're, they're, they're a big, valuable partner, I think, to the town. Um, I don't have a problem with it saying resort casino. Probably not. But um, I wonder if they do change the name at some point in time. Uh, who knows? Um, and they want to continue to have that presence. We ask them to pay for the remake. I don't see them changing the name, but I think they're a valuable partner to the town unless I'm missing something. Um, anybody else have any thoughts on that? Thank you, Mayor. I, I agree. Um, they're a very valuable partner to the town. They're, um, if that's the one request of our neighbors, I'd, I'd like to stick with that. Um, I mean, we weren't, we weren't given a laundry list for these, so I'm happy to uh, accommodate one request. When it comes to the name change, I, I mean, obviously, no one knows what the future holds. I could turn around and eat these words, but my inclination would be that given that they were voted, I believe, the number one golf course in Arizona, they have that name recognition. They're a very large, successful resort. My inclination would be that we don't probably have to worry about a name change. That would be a, a large change to the brand, and I don't see that as something in the near future. I, I mean, uh, assuming no catastrophes, I suppose. I think part of it was just to be consistent. So, um, you know, and, and I'm just remembering the conversation, and it was like, you know, because I think it might have been about the Holiday Inn at the time, and the, you know, why didn't we put Holiday Inn instead of just hotel or something like that? But, um, you know, I'm fine with it then. Um, I just didn't want to, um, and it probably doesn't happen in this case because that's a whole different area with a golf resort, because, you know, the whole thing, but I don't want to ever look like we've doing an advertisement for one particular, you know, golf course over another or something like that. So, but it's up to you guys, uh, Vice Mayor. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I think that, um, I think that's responsible. And Resort Casino, in deference to Alan, I, I appreciate your concern about having casino on our signage, but I, I think I concur with Jerry. I think Resort Casino uh, would be something I could, I could live with and it would avoid the inconsistency problem of, that the mayor pointed out. Anything else regarding this list? I just feel like we kind of have a split thing going on. I can see going either direction. Um, if we get down to it, we're probably talking two signs that say we copaw. Madam Mayor, Council Member, I'll, have to, I'll definitely have to take a look. 
there, there's a set of construction documents attached to the staff report that actually shows in more detail where each of them will go and the text that was selected on them. But I, I did not print that because it's a little bit large. The font is tiny. Um, yeah, I could totally see going either direction. I wholeheartedly support not mentioning one business over another. I totally get that concept. As a business owner, I'd be kind of upset if I had a resort and you were mentioning those guys and you didn't mention me. Um, but we do have a good tie-in. So now I've talked both sides of the fence, which I know, Mayor, you hate when I do. Um, but I, I honestly, I feel like we do kind of need to get rid of the name. And whether we put resort and golf course or however we want to phrase it, or Fort McDowell, maybe. Um, and that way they know that they're actually leaving Fountain Hills, maybe. Who, who made the ask for the name? And also thinking about our um, tourist agreement with them and relate, business relationship with them. Isn't it a little bit more formal? Oh. You mean like the top 200 stuff? Or? Well, no, I mean, like, it seems, it, based on things that have happened over the years, I think I've heard that we have like a tourist and an agreement. Can Amanda maybe can address this, please? And I just would like to know how formal that agreement is and if we would be harming that in any way by not putting the actual name of the resort. Madam Mayor, Council Member, um, we are, you've heard me use the term, we are designated as the designated marketing organization for the town. We do not have a specific agreement with Weekapaw, but just professionally speaking, hearing again, Council Member um, Grzbowski saying it seems kind of split, my recommendation would to leave the name out. Um, in my experience, hotels can change their name a lot or they can add to it because management teams change. I usually don't like to call hotels by name, but there's a hotel in our downtown where some people call it a certain name and I've only been here two years. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So it does happen, I use that as an example. So I would highly recommend, my professional opinion is to keep it resort. Because um, again, we have a Darrow resort. Should we add a Darrow? Is a Darrow potentially going to, to change their name? There's so many unknowns. So again, my professional recommendation is to take off Weekapaw. And again, we appreciate them. One thing that they asked me um, two years ago when I met them in my first 30 days is, they didn't call it the specific name, but they said, Amanda, could you please do something about those signs? Because as Mr. Weldy mentioned, they're different colors, sizes, and it was faded and faded and faderer. Um, so he started to, to remove those. So any other uh, questions? Also, I have another question for you. What about resort and casino? I mean, do you look, that, look at that as, as from your vantage point being detrimental or just a generic explanation for the fact that it's a resort and a casino. And people do come here and look for where the casino is. Madam Mayor, um, Councilmember McMahon, again, I would keep it short and sweet to, to just resort. Because again, Adaro, again, I don't like to call it different names, but they offer stargazing. Um, they offer other things. So it's sort of, where do we, where do we stop? So short and simple. And again, remember, people are, are driving by, trying to get directed. They're not spending tons of time reading all of that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I do like to go with the economic director's uh, idea there, a resort. I, I just think the casino has negative connotations to it. And I don't like the idea of advertising in our town. Anything else? I, I mean, I, I think a casino is fine because it's legal and it's our neighbor and we, we want to help them, but I'm all for just putting resort, too. I don't have a negative feel for, for a casino. Anything else on this item? <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, I, thank you, Madam Mayor. I was just going to add that we're just basically giving direction so they could come back to us with a whole new name. <laughs> <laughs> but we're just giving direction, and I think that we've, we've made our point. 
This incredibly easy to read map shows the location of each one of these signs. You'll note that the area in and around Town Hall was kind of blocked off there. Again, the um, attached to the staff report documents are a little less challenging. We looked at several different opportunities for breaking this up or making it bigger. This is really just to give you an overall but think of it as you would that obviously Shea, we would have signs, Palisades, Fountain Hills Boulevard, Saguaro, and then as we get closer to the core of town, there would be smaller signs on our minor collectors, major collectors, and our local roads. These are the primary signs, and this is the current text that will be shown on them, and each one of these numbers represents a location on the aforementioned map. So again, sort of jumping ahead, um, the idea that this will probably be uh, more than the 275 that we have. Um, if we start to look at having less signs, some less sign, uh, you know, like especially in town and such, would we ever consider putting like the mileage on it? So the downtown, so here is something on Shea, then you put it on Saguaro, and then rather having a bunch like kind of internal, just say like one mile or, you know, anything on there to give it a little bit more information without having another, because we're talking 40, what, six signs, I think? No, 40 signs. But, um, you know, if it ends up looking like we can't afford to do this many, this many signs, would we be able to do that? Uh, absolutely, Mayor, we can, we, again, we're here tonight to get direction based on, well, it's 100% concept is where we're at. So we're either ready to go to bid or make minor changes. Again, substantial changes, or we'll get an estimate, and then we'll come back to the mayor and council, depending on the dollar threshold. But we're here to get direction tonight on what you would like to see and what, the direction you would like to go. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Director, the, someone mentioned the font. Is the font big enough so seasoned citizens can see that while they drive by at 35 miles an hour? Madam Mayor, uh, Council Member, in, in fact, we're, we're going to dive in a little bit deeper, but if you'll recall back here a couple of slides, it actually has the font on this one here, so it looks like we're four and a half inches for the arrow and the font related to the community center and the text there, and three and a half inches lower to the bottom. And then as you can see, as we get to the bigger signs, we're looking at five inch primarily. Is that five or seven? I'm gonna need to get my glasses. So it's, it's based on the speed limit and the roadway geometry, which is primarily two lanes in each direction. There are some exceptions to that. You're welcome. So if I'm not mistaken here, we want to, for the primary signs out on Shea, add a mileage. I to think it's just going to... destinations or key destinations? It's just depending on if we can have the rest of the signs after they get in to where they're going that can direct them because at least from some preliminary discussions, this is very expensive. So if we have to cut something down and say they, they only have two signs to get to the shopping area or to the civic center, let's say, you know, to town hall, um, that would be the only reason to do it. So you're talking about cutting down on the smaller number of signs and adding miles to those signs? Just in case we have to cut down the small signs. We can, adding a, a little bit of text at this point in time, I don't see as a major issue. And, and we're certainly gonna discuss some money as we go on here. So we have a general idea of what we're discussing. 
These are the secondary signs. Again, these are primarily on Palisades, Fountain Hills Boulevard, and Saguaro. If we added mileage on these, would it change the font and the size? Slightly, yes. Okay. Smaller? Yes, ma'am. OK, thank you. These are the remainder. So obviously, there are more of these that would go on the minor and, and major collectors coming in Palisades, Saguaro. And lastly, these are the smaller ones that would be closer to the destination and or the town core in that area or other destinations as described on each of the signs. Lots of information, huh? Lastly, as you can see by the image in the middle of the page, this was part of a branding some years ago in which the town council agreed to purchase and install these town center signs. We have a couple of dozen of them remaining and enough to be in storage to replace them for the next 30 years. These were purchased uh, early 2000s, and they decided at that time, because of the cost, to just purchase them in bulk. So the top portion of this and the powder-coated poles, there's quite a collection of these at the street department. With the rebranding of the town center to downtown, one of the concepts was to cover up the town center. Because this is a little bit more challenging and these are localized in what was formerly known as the town center, but now downtown. Staff was uncomfortable in regards to giving any real direction. The original design was to make them kiosks and or poster locations that would be managed by either community services and or public works. And obviously the posters or the information contained in them would be changed periodically. Keep in mind that these are primarily walking. And at the time they were installed, not all of them are immediately adjacent to a walking path. The majority of them will be here thanks to a generous donation by this council and the federal government for sidewalk gap elimination. But so we're really asking for some direction on this. What would you like to see with these basically 25 signs? I think it's going to depend on the size and what sign that the fountain would fit onto. So these are existing. What the proposed cover is approximately six feet tall and approximately four feet ten wide. Mm -hmm. So slightly taller than me and slightly narrower than me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, okay, um, Amanda, a question as far as branding goes. Would you like to see these on just the ones that are downtown or the ones that are on Shea and the major thoroughfares or just scattered around town? <laughs> Madam Mayor, these signs are in the town center area, a.k.a. the downtown. They're nowhere else. These are just right here in the core. Right. Oh, okay. Wait, I just wanted to clarify had, that. Sorry. You, did you say you had like two dozen of them mm -hmm. left somewhere, not be used, being used? Madam Mayor, we do have replacements. This type of sign is simply too small for anybody over a decent pace on a bicycle. Because, again, we're talking about a poster that would be put in there. Or if you would like, you can certainly add a wayfinding type sign in there. It's two-sided also. One on either side was the way they were designed. Madam Mayor, Council Member, can you repeat your question? 
I heard the branding. Right. As far as the, this or the other signs. Yeah. As far as consistency, the branding, and then Justin answered my question as far as they're just downtown. So I guess what you do you see or would like to see? Madam Mayor, Councilmember, I appreciate the question. What I would love to see in the direction B is some of this is operational, and we leave that to our professional staff, just being honest. Um, also, I think because we're going through the downtown strategy process, we are getting lots of feedback and themes on signage, and where some people are mentioning, you know, is this where, again, you highlight the fountain, fountain park, and the districts? Um, where some of them are named. So there's lots of ideas. Um, so I think to be determined, if we can work on that more operationally instead of at the policy level um, is just my ask. Since you asked me, Thank you. you're welcome. So the direction on these? I think as since we are having this discussion about downtown, um, when I first look at it, I, it kind of looks like you might want it to be something to do with hiking or going to a park or going to a Darrow or something. But uh, at, th at this point, I don't think we need to make a decision on these, right, Rachel? <laughs> no, I think, again, these are existing. And I think um, Amanda actually makes a good point that, you know, as we go through the strategy, as, as we hear feedback, let the brainstorming happen and perhaps we come up with an idea that hasn't even been discussed tonight. I think that there's some value to that. Um, you've heard one suggestion, but I think again, if we can maybe table this portion of it to allow the staff and, and some ideas to kind of come together on that, I think that's a better idea. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I think this has been constructive um, support. I also think if, if we approve this, we're not saying don't change it. This is just giving direction. Um, and I, I think that these pay for themselves uh, over time. Uh, the, and maybe something to consider is the uh, items like uh, hiking trails, that they're great, I love them, but they, they don't have any revenue. So I, maybe that is to be discussed. But in a f the fact is I don't need to micromanage this and I trust the, the, the staff and the concept so far. So I think they've done a good job and I, I think we should continue going down this road. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, just something that is not setting with me well right now, and I just want to bring it up real quickly, is this, the, the Weekapaw Resort sign, Resort Casino. Um, if this was addressed by a previous mayor and two previous councils, would it be possible for us to just have staff reach out to the casino and just get input on that before we kind of make a heavy-handed decision here because we do have a very valuable relationship. And I, I don't want to ruffle, yeah, I don't want to ruffle feathers over this. So I think if we can get their input, that would really be helpful. A couple of things that we need to go over here that are going to be a little uncomfortable for some is the money. As I had stated earlier in this presentation, this started back in 2017. Do you want to hear the numbers that we've spent up to date and then the engineer's estimate for fabrication and installation? So for in 2018, the original concept was about $31,000. That's what we paid. In 2019, for the finalized portion of that, it's 49,000. In 2023, we paid 9,000 for a structural engineer and $13,000 for the concepts and the plans. To date, we're about $104,000 into this. And I'm bringing this up simply because of the number of emails and phone calls I received at comments from the public that have had a chance to look at this once the agenda was released. The engineer's estimate is just under $700,000 to fabricate and install these signs. Keep in mind, there is a lot of traffic control necessary because we live in a hillside community and we would not ask anyone working for us, just like we do not allow anyone working for anyone else to work in unsafe conditions 
so it requires off-duty police officers and traffic control and oftentimes several different times and and also note uh, for any of you that has went out in your backyard and decided to plant a tree or anything there's a little bit of rock in the ground so we can expect that so knowing that we are prepared to make these minor adjustments based on communication we get from the Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation and place these documents out for bid. We'll know the true cost to design and install them when we open those bids and bring it back to the mayor and council. That's really where we're at. We, we have your input. I don't think there's any substantial changes in regards to adding some mileage or removing or changing one name, depending again on conversation between the town manager and the president of the neighboring uh, nation. But I didn't want anybody to get caught off guard either when we come back. Can I ask a question? Um, in your analysis with the mileage, will you be able to tell us how many signs or duplication that you'll be able to reduce this by? And then will that be in your estimate of actual costs then too? Madam Mayor, Council Member, the, the number of signs, uh, so adding the mileage isn't going to be that substantial. So the lettering is just a few pennies right now. And it's not likely, we'll, we may have to work a little bit on shifting where the text lies on the sign, but I don't see adding mileage as that big of a deal. And again, we will speak to the firm that prepared these plans and confirm that. We certainly would not proceed without doing so. So it, if the question is, do we want to eliminate some of the vehicular signage in the core, if that's a direction, we can certainly look at, at eliminating those. We can reduce a number of any of the sizes that you would like, if that's the direction you're thinking. Again. The engineer's estimate is just that. We will not know the true numbers until we unseal those bids. I forgot to, well, I didn't forget, but did we have any speaker cards on this, Linda? Yes, Mayor, we do. First of all, in your packet, you have written comments, seven people for this, nobody's against it. And then we have one speaker card, Betsy Lavoie. Hi, Betsy Lavoy, Fountain Hills resident. I'm here to express my support for the implementation of the Wayfinding Sign Project outlined in the staff report. As a resident of this town, I firmly believe that establishing a comprehensive and user-friendly signage and wayfinding system is essential for enhancing the overall experience of both visitors and citizens alike. The current state, as you know, of our wayfinding system is outdated, inconsistent, and often difficult to navigate, particularly in downtown areas. By investing in this project, we have the opportunity to create a cohesive streetscape environment that not only improves navigation, but also enhances the aesthetic identity of our town. But as the president and CEO of the Fountain Hills Chamber of Commerce, we are a partner to the town and support the additional benefit to the business community that this project will bring. Improved navigation will undoubtedly lead to increased foot traffic and exposure for local businesses, thereby enhancing economic vitality. Vitality. The goals and action items outlined in the town's 2020 general plan and economic development strategy align perfectly with the objectives of this project. Clear and concise aid in navigation will not only facilitate ease of movement, but also contribute to the thriving environment and connectivity within our business community. The Wayfinding Sign Project also presents a wonderful alternative to the blue ADOT signs that we are allowed to place for our visitor center. As the official visitor center for the town of Fountain Hills, I recommend these wayfinding signs be placed at the gateways to our main arteries to avoid the need for those large blue ADOT visitor signs. And we can detract from the aesthetic appeal of our town from the large 
affluents. Additionally, the Arizona Sign Association has for years emphasized the urgent need for wayfinding signage in our town. For too long, this issue has been neglected and it's time for action, not neglected, just kicked down the road. Delaying the final design would only result in increased costs for eventual fabrication and construction, making it imperative that we proceed with the design, fabrication, installation as recommended by staff. In conclusion, I urge the town council to please support after seven long years, this wayfinding sign project. By doing so, will not only enhance navigation and accessibility within our community, but also create a more vibrant and welcoming environment for all. Thank you. Uh, Betsy, Betsy, can I ask on, you a quick sec. question? Did you just say that the chamber wanted to go halves with us on this? <laughs> Did you? Yeah. So to be clear, what would we be saying? What would we be saying yes to? So the possible changes, but there's no um, obligation here to 700 grand. Yeah. Um, Mayor, if I may, I think what we heard tonight, and please chime in if I misheard or if I forget anything here, is that. Um, in general, you like the concepts here. We have some changes. I've noted here, we're gonna reach out to Weekapa. We're gonna chat with them to see about that. Um, look into adding the mileage. Um, I actually noted a couple little minor errors about some name changes we'll need to make too. But again, those are not high, you know, they're not a problem. Um, we just wanna make sure we get it right. Um, and then if there's a way to reduce some of the sign, once we add the mileage, if there's a way to potentially reduce some of the recommended or noted signs to save on costs, um, we'll take a look at that and perhaps make a recommendation on where we think that might be most appropriate. Um, and then we're gonna hold off on any changes right now regarding the existing town center um, infrastructure and potentially hear some ideas during our brainstorming and our um, downtown strategic plan process. Assuming that's the right assessment, we'll take this back, we'll go back and get some finalized plans, we'll, and then we will move to the bidding process to get an idea of what it's really going to take to fabricate and install. That's the next step, Justin? Correct. Awesome. Do you have an idea of when we're looking to issue that RFP, RFP? I would really like to have um, notice of award to the council prior to them going on the summer break. Okay. So it takes a little while here, and then <clears throat> also uh, allows us an opportunity to uh, speak with the tandem CFOs regarding the lack of funding in next year's budget for this. Mm -hmm. oh, actually, and that moves pretty fast. If we're going to issue it and notify award and all of that good stuff in the remainder of this fiscal, that's actually qu pretty quick. So. Correct. Okay. That sounds great. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Mayor. And just to revisit my earlier point on color, do we have to make that decision tonight or can we do that more closer to when we get a, a, a bid, the bidding process? Well, we really need to decide that tonight because the documents that we release for bid, the contractors are going to base their bidding pricing and their unit pricing on that. Okay, be, 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 I just, just see, it just seems like the colors that were selected in your presentation were kind of dark and ominous. And like I said, that aged copper in the background and like an ivory just seems like it'd be more welcoming. And like I said, I did spend a week looking at wayfinding signs. <laughs> and I, I, I really, I looked at the dark ones, I looked at the lighter ones, and um, it just seems like the, the lighter ones were more friendly on the eyes. And for especially for this kind of a community. Are you referencing the back of the sign, Vice Mayor? Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the back, I would prefer like an aged copper, like a, that lighter green. And then in the front of the sign where the black uh, lettering would be or white lettering would be, would be ivory. Just throwing it out there. So, so the, the darker portion is weathered steel. Okay. Yeah. Rust, if you would. Okay. <laughs> so that's the I one in the, the bottom. Green on white PC. Is, is, yeah, okay. is what was selected. If you would like to change the face color of the face of the sign and the font, tonight is the night to do that. So do we have like four choices where the color schedule is, P1 to P4? Where are you seeing this, Vice Mayor? That's at the uh, Smithcraft Custom Architectural <sighs> Signs, page two. 
Can I jump in or no? I, I kind of like what we have here. Well, that's just what we're talking about. I mean, I'm not yeah. just throwing it out there. Yeah. I was just going to pretty much say the same thing. I like the existing colors. Um, I think that they're easily readable. I think the weathered steel will look very nice as well. So I'm, I'm fine with the coloring. Um, I ditto my neighbors here. Um, a, when you're driving on the highway, green is often the destination color that you see. So I, I like the green, plus it blends in and it matches the greenery of the scenery. And then of course the automatic rust thing, psh, that's great because then when it does rust, it looks normal. So yeah, I like it. I think it's easy on the eyes and I like the color scheme with the background. I think, yeah, I think it's under project plans. That's the second um, attachment. But, um, um, Madam Vice Mayor, I don't. I was. I had a set of older documents opened here, but I don't have the the, the ones that are in the staff report. Okay. Okay. So it it sounds like currently we're going to stay with the hunter green and white on weathered steel. Mm. Is that correct? And we'll make minor changes to the text, include the mileage. Town manager will speak to the neighboring president and we'll implement those minor changes. Any motion? Motion to approve. <laughs> Second. And just to be clear, the motion is to Right. Direct staff right. Right <laughs> to incorporate the recommended <laughs> changes and procedure to the competitive bidding process. We have a motion and a second. Moral call, please. Councilmember Grzybowski. Aye. Councilmember McMahon. Aye. Councilmember Toth. Aye. Councilmember Friedel. Aye. Councilmember Skillicorn. Yes. Vice Mayor Calavianakis. Aye. Mayor Dickey. Aye. We have a unanimous vote. <laughs> Thank you, clerk. <laughs> uh, our next item is about public art. Rachel? Thank you, Justin. You're welcome. Thanks, Justin. I'm actually going to have Kevin introduce um, the public art item, and then I think we have a member or two of our public art committee um, to walk us through this tonight. Thank you, Madam Mayor Council. Um, tonight we're here to um, check and see, uh, look for approval for the public art that has been selected. Uh, we wanted to make sure that you had the opportunity to see what was, um, what is going to go up in our park uh, prior to that happening. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to a couple of our public art committee members. Um, Jenny and Cheryl are here, so I'll ask them to come up. Madam Mayor and Council Members, the on Fountain Hills Public Art Committee received over 300 applicants for the second year of the public of the Pump House program. The theme this year was exhibit. This exhibit is expressions, with the artist's interpretation of a facial expression that portrays an emotion. The origin of the face could be human, animal, or plant. All costs associated with the fabrication and installation of the panels will be responsible of the Public Art Committee. Artists chosen for this project will receive a $200 honorarium and artwork will be featured on the public art website. And these are the seven pieces of art that were selected of the 300. Why don't we scroll down, Kevin? Mayor and Council, I assume you all have this in your package, correct? So you're able to look over the paragraphs that were attached. I thought the one thing that was kind of interesting this year is we've got seven different states. 
which is kind of fun. We had New York all the way to Oregon, I think. So these were our finalists. Anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Did we have any speaker cards? Yes, Mayor, we do. We have one in your packet who is for this um, project, and then we have Ed Stizza. So, hi. Good evening. Um, I got a couple questions. So, this is how big of an area again? Exactly. These are the panels down by the Veterans Memorial, correct? What happened to the butterfly project? I thought there was butterflies going to go on the wall. What happened? Just out of curiosity. That's number one. Number two, boy, I moved to Fountain Hills or the years ago. My family moved here because it was a southwest desert location and destination. And I love art. I love it. Love it. It's a big passion of mine. I just don't really see, I know in all due respect, there was 300 applicants, it sounds like, right? And I've looked over these images and I just don't think they really represent uh, what Fountain Hills and what people should be looking at down there. Right next to the Veterans Memorial, a little bit spread out in the conceptual or conceptual and Colors, I don't know how it would look. It would nice it would be nice to see a rendering of this uh, overall, how it's going to be laid out or what the thought process is. And again, the public uh, options have been completely eliminated from this, right? I mean, i just seen this fairly recently. So we didn't bring any of this to the public on maybe what the public might want to look at and the, the 300 possibilities, or did we? I don't know, I'm asking. So I don't know if they can answer that. And, but I don't remember seeing this as possibly an option or uh, the options presented to the public. So just doesn't seem like, I get the ideas, I see the artwork, but just doesn't seem like it's, um, I don't know. I would think of these images in downtown San Francisco or Los Angeles, something much more urban. Um, I don't feel this really represents a good use of that space as far as, as, far as the uh, images. So it would be nice to be able to see some more options here, especially is there a cost to this? Do we know? That's the other thing. You know, I'll let the folks come up, but just, you know, for statues and everything else, sculptures, I mean, we, we, have, we have a public art committee and then the council sees it as we are seeing this now and then we discuss it. That's how it's always been. Um, but I'll let you guys uh, come up and talk a little bit more about process and um, what was the other? Oh, cost. Pro thanks. Um, I'll go back and explain where we came about with this idea. Uh, the mural was going to be butterflies, he's correct about that, and that was back in 2020, I think. But the Public Art Committee, having been down that road before, realizes that that fades and it chips. And we're constantly going back and having to repair and replace at an expense. So this concept was represented last year as a pump house pilot project. And we did the first year of the art and had the selections. Am I not close enough? So um, that theme last year was Legends and Lore of the Valley. Every year we intend to change the theme. And this year the theme was Expressions. And I believe that was presented here a couple of months back. So last year we did not have quite as many entries. There was a cost associated with applying. This year we eliminated the cost, that cost. Therefore we had a lot of images. Now, even though there were 300, making that be a zero expense, we ended up with a lot of images that were not sized appropriately. People just simply didn't follow the directions. So that being said, I can't give you an exact number. I'm still thinking we had at least 200 images. And we do have a committee. We go through a process. We all have a vote. It's about 80% based on the art, 20% based on the accompanying paragraph. And these, again, were our finalists. Now, the hope of this project is to change every year and to have different art that stays bright and you know does put 
a different look on our community every year. And I think we're accomplishing that goal. So I'm, I'm proud of this project. I wanna see it move forward. And for the gentleman, if you do go to the Fountain Hills Public Art website, you will see the display last year, how the art was applied to the wall. Mm -hmm. There is a visual. I remember the conversation about the, the problem with painting the concrete. That was, a, it, I agree wholeheartedly. We used to have a concrete house and you wanna paint all the sides and the concrete just doesn't like the paint. So that was a big conversation. We discussed it. You, you brought it up to us at council and we agreed, let's find another solution and you came up with a great one. I love your theme. I think it's fantastic. Um, the artwork is absolutely stunning. I can't wait to see these things on the plates. Art is in the eye of the beholder. Not everybody likes Southwestern art. It's just a thing. Um, one of the suggestions I have for anybody that f finds that they don't like the way this process is done, next time we have an opening on the public art committee, maybe they should apply. But. I love your theme, I love the photos. More power to you for going through 200 to pick your favorites. I have absolutely no idea how I would do something like that. I love this and I'm gonna be yes after somebody makes a motion. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, I second that with what Sharon said. I think this is beautiful. I think each and every one of these are indiv individual, have great expressions. And I think it's going to look fantastic where it is. And I appreciate all the, your due diligence going through, what, 300, et cetera. And I love the explanations about each of the pictures so that you can understand them. So thank you very much for doing this. And I look forward to next year's as well. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I just had a question. Um, so we have one local artist that made the cut? Yes, we only had one local artist. Now, we don't look at that. I mean, what we oh. look at is the paragraph and the artwork. So there were a few more that I know of that applied. And, uh, you know, that's why we go through the process where it's kind of a blind I thought system. maybe, though, when we... I remember you mentioning expressions, and I remember the butterfly thing that Ed Stizza talked about. I thought this would be more to to highlight local artists from that from our town, like the uh, the regional, art league. I'm it's sorry. A regional contest. It's a regional contest. It seems like we we stretched our region pretty yeah, far. Yeah, a few people jumped in there that, you know. Again, we don't look at where they're from. We look so, at the paragraph. So, so like artwork. the Fountain Hills Art League, uh, they've got like 50 members. Were they involved with this? I presented it to the art league. Okay. And I went around and encouraged several of them to apply. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, I've got strengths and I've got weaknesses. <laughs> and art is uh, not my strength. And so it's just good that we have a committee like yourself that is so engaged with the various art community and has done a lot of research and work on that. And um, that's, what, that's why we have committees and that's why we have experts. And so thank you for all, all the time that you spent putting this together and for these recommendations. And, uh, you know, it looks pretty nice to me. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman? Can I make a motion? Yeah, and then I just want to say something. Okay. But I was just going to say, when, we, when you first started, did you say expressions of plants, too? Plants. <laughs> did you yeah. say plants? Yeah, we did. All right. We said that it could be a v or human, a animal, or plant. You know, sometimes you can have a... So no Audrey too. I was expecting no, to see no, little no. little shop of horrors or something. So no, I mean, there, were, there was a great variety, and yeah, it was a hard choice to tell the truth. Thank you, Councilwoman. I'd like to make a motion to approve the second year of the Public Art Committee Pump House Wall Project, and authorize the installation of expressions artwork submissions. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Can we get a roll call, please? Councilmember McMahon. Aye. Councilmember Toth. Nay, but only because I'd love to see more Arizona. I love your theme. I love what you're doing. I love you guys. I'm sorry. Councilmember Friedel. Aye. Councilmember Skillicorn. Yes. 
Councilmember Grzybowski. Aye. Vice Mayor Kalavianakis. Aye. Mayor Dickey. Aye. Passes Thanks. six to one. Thanks you guys very much. Thank you. Yes. Our next item is the AI uh, consideration of adopting an ethical artificial intelligence policy. We had this brought to us by the vice mayor. So we'll have our presentation. We'll see if we have any car speaker cards and then we'll discuss. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Town Council. I'll be brief. Um, I, I'm sure there's gonna be tons of questions. Um, I have the pleasure of presenting the town's ethical or artificial intelligence policy for your consideration. At the request of Vice Mayor Kalvanakis, staff was directed <clears throat> to draft a policy governing the implementation and use of artificial intelligence technologies. So this is just a framework outlining the responsibilities of the town while implementing and using uh, any AI technology. At this time, the town doesn't have any plans to implement AI technologies. That doesn't mean that down the road we won't. Um, this policy, be, policy will be reviewed periodically and updated as necessary to address emerging challenges, um, tech, tech, excuse me, technological advancements, and changes in legal and regulatory frameworks related to AI. The town's AI policy <clears throat> affirms, affirms the commitment um, to responsible and ethical use of AI through the principles that ensure transparency, fairness, accountability, and protection of individual rights and privacy in all AI-related activities conducted by the town. So this policy only relates to bless you, the operations of the town. Um, it doesn't have any um, impact in the community other than town of Fountain Hills. Um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, do we have any speaker cards? Yes, Mayor, we do. First, we have one comment that they're for the policy, and then we have one speaker card, and that's Matthew Corrigan. Mayor of Council, Matthew Corrigan. I just urge uh, a little bit of caution and further review on this policy tonight, agenda item 9E. And um, it's not the establishment of the ethical IE policy itself, but maybe the temptation of the town government to expand its reach, you know, either by hiring more staff or expanding the information technology administrator role, or by renaming his title or authority to control town employee communications. Don't get me wrong, I love our town, I love it the way it is, but I have concerns, as maybe we all should. Why the caution and the concern? We've all read about it, we all know about it, maybe we just need to remember what just happened. Let's review. On April 9th, 2012, 12 years ago, the town of Gilbert, Arizona hired Dana Bershman as communications manager. Bershman was praised by media, government leaders, AI industry, the tech industry, and showered with awards. Bershman was rewarded well over a 12-year span and became the chief digital officer of Office of Digital, uh, digital Governance, ODG with 12 employees and control 30 digital accounts and all personal online posts. Bershman's annual salary was $200,800 annual, and her department cost Gilbert taxpayers $1.15 million annually. Public records revealed that under Bershman, ODG contracted various leadership, contacted various leadership about employees' online speech if they ran counter to her progressive ideals or appeared to be critical of her department, ODG. Leadership was then expected to confront the employees about their speech when the story went public via AZ Free News sources. And in January, Gilbert Town Council meeting, 
heard from residents who demanded an end to the free speech violations. One former employee, on the condition of anonymity, said they left their job in part due to ODG's control over the departments. Now again, this is a bit of history, but then again, remember what happened. Dana Bershman resigned on February 20th this year prior to the town council investigation of her activities. Her last day was March 7th. That's not to say that could happen here. It might happen here. I just want to be cautious in proceeding with our description of the AI ethical policy and not go beyond that. My only concern. I love the town. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I think uh, Council, <laughs> Councilor Toth was first, though. That's all right. Uh, you gave the tie to me on the second. I'll let you go first on this all right, one. Just a quick, quick question for Administrator Cicerone. Um, is this uh, like an ideal set of practices? Um, you know, what, the research that you did to come up with this, I'm sure it wasn't out of the blue. You just, we, don't need, we don't need a long, long explanation. Just kind of curious where it came from. Sure. Uh, so this policy um, is based on the City of Tempe's um, AI policy. Um, I did also take a look at City of San Jose, um, City of Seattle, City of Boston. They're kind of the leaders in AI technologies. Um, and did pull some parts out of their policies, but I think the Tempe one um, pretty much matched what we were looking for. Um, and I think the Vice Mayor could probably speak on that as well. I was going to say, let's let um, Hannah ask her question, and then Brenda, why don't you um, yeah. speak on this? Thanks. Thank you. Um, I actually, sorry, it's not a question. Is it, it, It's a comment. Is that still okay? Okay. <laughs> um, this is actually something that um, I had also brought up at one point, um, and to quell what could be or could not be concerns. It's just words I hear about AI online, so I don't know if it really applies. But um, to quell some concerns that could be present in the community when it comes to us making a policy on AI, the reality is, is it be much worse to not have one? AI is not just um, like the sci-fi movies, you know, the um, computer and I robot that yeah, it's not like that. It's also chat GPT and things that help with your writing and help with uh, productivity in the office that could be a realistic addition in the future to the town. And anyway, I just, I appreciate the staff's work and researching this and just in case there's any perception that we're gonna have iRobot as a new uh, code enforcement officer or something, that's not what this is. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, and Mike, thank you for all the hard work that you did on this. I know you worked extensively and you kept me in the loop all the way and I really appreciate that. And the reason that I, I thought this was important, I think it's really good public policy, is many municipalities across the country are getting these policies now. And this is like the outline to what's gonna become the book later. It's, it's a start. Um, importantly, it's like at the end, it talks about the review process and how this is gonna be updated, 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 and maybe we should have started with that, <laughs> but just, that's a joke. Because this is the beginning of a process. Um, when, when Hannah mentions your concern about the, the interactive programs, that um, you can use to, to, to write. I, I can literally see um, a time where this AI kind of program will do all of our correspondence for us, will handle calls from the, even the public, do our writing for us. And, and I think it's important for our residents to know, yeah, did this come from a, a robot? Or did this come from a, the mayor? Or did this come from the vice mayor? Or did this come from a council member? Because we, we're not gonna know. And, just so we all kind of get it here. There's a, like when the wheel was invented to change things, when the automobile was invented. Well, most of us were here when the internet was created and it's just changed life as we know it fundamentally at, at a molecular level. And so when you, when you combine quantum computing and, and an intelligent program, they can actually think um, it's, it can be really scary. 
And the one thing too with the, with the next generation of programming is before the supercomputers simply had an yes or no, yes or no, uh, approve, not approve. With, with the new programming that's coming up, it's, it's, there, there's not switches yes, no, but there may be, and this might be better for you. And so it's, it's gonna take you on a journey <laughs> that you might not have wanted to take it. And so I, I, I'm just very concerned about that. And I'm, I'm also very concerned that, you know, five years from now, somebody can have, have complained to the town three times and then finally confronts you in a grocery store. And like, yeah, I've corresponded with the, the town and I've talked to people. And then you do the research and it's like, you know what, all those contacts were with a machine. You never talked to a person. And so I, I think it's good that we respect human rights, human dignity, and this should be a tool that we use. We shouldn't be the tool it uses. And that's why we wanted this policy. So thank you very much. Sorry, just a funny sidebar, but speaking of how quickly the AI technology has advanced and why it's important for us to have a policy now, even though we're not necessarily planning on using it soon, it, it is a tool and it's helpful. It can help our productivity. But to our vice mayor's point, um, we're already seeing some kind of scary stuff with AI, um, not to not go in tinfoil hat over here. I just, uh, Google recently actually got in some trouble because in, in efforts to do a good thing and to be helpful, they accidentally overcompensated and it ended up like practically impossible for it to generate a picture of a white male. <laughs> and there, there's been all these stories coming out. I don't know if anyone else is getting these, but I swear I get them like three times a day. These phone calls that are from maybe real nonprofits, maybe not, asking for donations and you think it's a real person and you go, you know, you try and say something of, oh yeah, I, I wanna support that, but you know, I'd rather do it later and then they ask the same question and you go, oh, I'm talking to a robot right now. And uh, maybe that reveals how I should maybe pay more attention when I'm on the phone and maybe I should be realizing right away that it's a robot, but my point being, this technology is so new and it's advancing so quickly because there's so many of our greatest minds working on it right now, which is wonderful and it's exciting, but there's also opening up that need to kind of protect ourselves from how it's used if we do use it. And um, I will stop ranting about it now. <laughs> I do agree that it totally helps with productivity. I think that we forget that we've been using chatbots for years. We've been talking to AI, like years. I don't think you guys realize how many years it's been. Um, my husband's full-time job is security for big data software companies. So I gave it to him to review and he said he doesn't see any problems with it. It's a, it's a great go. Um, and I'm actually under the impression that you guys were working on this long before the councilwoman even brought it up. So I appreciate the work that you guys did on it and the, the different towns and cities that you've looped in and tried to do the right thing for us. Thank you. Mayor, if I may. Um, so I'm part of the MAGTEG, um, it's the Maricopa County, uh, excuse me, the Maricopa Associates, excuse me, Association of Governments Technology Advisory Group. And it's something that we've been talking about in that group setting for months now. Um, I think Tempe started off with talking about their policy. Pretty much all the other cities, member cities, are in that same boat trying to figure out a policy. Um, and, and basing it on the, the Tempe one, obviously making their tweaks, I think the Tempe policy was a page and a half, and we turned it into three and a half, four pages. Um, so I think ours is a little bit more comprehensive, um, but it's kind of that same thing. It's gonna, it's gonna be updated, needs to be updated, because the technology is changing so quickly. And then one final thought. I think the next year we're gonna start to see AI come to our phones, um, come to our computers, and it's gonna be more prevalent in, in everyday life. So if we don't choose to accept it now, it's going to come um, and we'll be just doing this down the road. So I think it comes at a good time. Definitely, they, um, 
there were a couple articles because I wanted to try to get to know a little bit more about it too. And one of one of them was about Tempe, and I think they started like in June. And then um, reading how cities are taking the lead on this all over the country. So I think that's something that is very appropriate for us. Um, I. And part of what I saw was that a growing number of universities are starting to have AI as a major. Um, so I, I, they're, they're recognizing it. They're, it's in health and transportation and just all kinds of public policy. Um, so unless there's any other um, comments, I get a motion, please. Yeah, move to adopt the uh, Town of Fountain Hills Ethical Artificial Intelligence Policy. Second. Thank you. Roll call, please. Councilmember Toth. Aye. Councilmember Fidel. Aye. Councilmember Skillicorn. Aye. Councilmember Grzybowski. Aye. Councilmember McMahon. Aye. Vice Mayor Kalavianakis. Aye. Mayor Dickey. Aye. Passes unanimously. unanimously. <laughs> <laughs> Easy for you to say. Well, thank you very much. Um, our next item is our typical legislative one. Um, we had a call yesterday with, a, and then they sent us a pretty good um, wrap up on it. I think if, if anything I want to mention is just that there are two zoning bills that that we do support. So we, I think that was one of his messages was that not we're not always saying no to everything. We are compromising. So on 1162 residential zoning, housing assessment hearings and. Even though it's a population of 30,000 or more, there are a couple things in there that would apply to us, but it's a good bill. And 2297, zoning adaptive reuse, commercial buildings, um, is also one that we want to support. And there's a couple of really um, ones, uh, I never like to say bad bills, but um, just bills that aren't good for the town. Um, and so they'll be working on those and to trying to uh, see if we can um, if they can put a stop to those. Did anybody, I'm sure you all got the same email, so do you want to talk about any of that? Or I think we've taken positions on all of them already. So, um, okay. So we don't have any action on that. Um, as far as call to the public, did was there anything there for action? I don't think so. Um, and then uh, future agenda items, item 11. Um, no. All right. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and we're adjourned.